Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Victoria City Hall, uh, located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples, uh, and to the council meeting of Thursday, June the 9th. Uh, you have, and we have, an agenda before us, and it has been updated and amended uh, a number of times since it was published for council and the public on Friday. So I'm going to ask our city clerk, Mr. Coates, to read through uh, for council and the public the changes that have been made to the agenda. Mr. Coates. Thank you, Mayor Helps. Members of Council, the changes to the agenda for this evening are firstly in Section C, request to address Council. One speaker has withdrawn uh, his request. In Section E, public and statutory hearings. Uh, for item number two, there is late correspondence regarding the hearings for 943 Collinson Street and 1535 Davy Street. In Section F, request to address Council. Uh, one speaker has withdrawn his name and uh, nine new speaker names have been added. In Section H, Reports of Committees, there is the Committee of the Whole report from the June 9th Committee of the Whole meeting and additional correspondence regarding item number six in the June 9th Committee of the Whole report regarding the heritage alteration permit for uh, 537 Johnson Street. In Section J, Bylaws, there's a late bylaw attachments for three bylaws related to 605-629 Speed Avenue and 606-618 Francis Avenue. And lastly, in new business um, section L, there is a council member motion uh, for council to consider on the review of Canada Post. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Coates. Uh, with that, council, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Absolutely. Thanks. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe. Council, I have one proposed speaker to add to the agenda. And I've asked Mr. Coates from now on, our council bylaw asks that after after 11 o'clock on Wednesday, if somebody wants to address council, they need to find a council member to uh, to add them. So I've asked Mr. Coates that if anyone shows up in legislative services between 11 a.m. on Wednesday and 4.30 p.m. today, that he collect the names, give us one list, and, uh, and then we can make a motion to add that. It's more effective that way. So uh, with that, I propose that we add Chris... Christian Barnard um, with regards to Waddington Alley uh, as an extra speaker. Is there a seconder? Thanks. Seconded by Councillor Isaac. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you, Councillor Isaac. And there's one additional speaking request. Donna Umbras or Umbus uh, wants to address the issue of homelessness. Okay. Is there a seconder to add Donna as our 22nd speaker in the second round? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, uh, Council, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favour? Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we begin this evening with a poetry reading from the City of Victoria's Poet Laureate, Yvonne Blomer. Welcome, Yvonne. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Okay, it looks like it's going to be a busy night. 22 speakers. Wow. Um, what do I have to say? Yesterday was World Ocean Day, and um, I held an event at the library with a scientist and two poets, which was really amazing. And then we were a very small group because it was windy, cold, and wet. Walked along the beach towards Songhees Park and cleaned up the beaches. And there were four bags of yucky things, mostly <laughs> styrofoam, syringes, plastic, a few beer bottles, one shoe, and a cooler lid. So that was World Ocean Day for me. And tonight in Winnipeg, this wonderful prairie fire is being launched. And I have a poem in it, but obviously I can't be in Winnipeg. And it's an important issue because it's about the suffrage 100 women of Manitoba. My poem is not. My poem is about the ocean, called Fog. Gray's Harbor. We walk when the sun and earth move again, when the long grasses bellow the horn's song. Damp fingers stroke me. I dip and bob, am coated in spray, by cloud and the breath of sea lions, the breath of the deep sea skates. Forgetting is remembering in reverse. Along the coast, I dance and skip. I lie still, I slip beneath waves of fog, feathers of fog. 
To desire is to forget everything. To desire is fog, salted breath on skin, flesh, and the tides of flesh. When I said her broken wing, I meant turn back. I meant the disjointed clouds. I meant the tide has pulled me out. I meant the island. All day we walked toward the island. With each step, what we remembered vanished. The motorhomes and trucks, the dogs and fishermen. We followed the tide. It vanished. What shadows? All day, the last traces of light stolen by the sea. Why care anyway? All day, I waited for the sound of the horn. I fanned the sharp grasses. I watched the ragged masts grown from the sea vanish and the perfect heron shadows. I saw the fragile purple flowers, their shallow roots saw the carapace of skate egg and mistook it for kelp. I dipped my hand and drank from the sea. I dipped and drank fog. I drew breath or water into gills. I listened for what spills from this tipping earth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Blomer. Uh, Council, the next item of business are our minutes from May the 12th. Could I have those moved for adoption, please? Thanks. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Any corrections to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to call the question. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. We now move on to our first section of requests to address Council. There are five speakers in this section and there are 21 speakers in the next section. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to say everything now and then I'm going to say it again later. So if you're here for the long haul, you'll hear me say the same thing twice. Uh, but I think it's important that I do. So first of all, this is a time for council to address the public. Uh, it's not a time for interaction between council and the public. Um, requests to address council are an important part of our business because it's our opportunity to hear from you. Uh, having said that, we also have a lot of other business uh, on our agenda this evening. Um, noting that, uh, everyone who has signed up to address us has five minutes to speak. Uh, when you get to the podium uh, up here, the timer will say five. Uh, there will be a green light. When you get to one minute, uh, it will turn yellow. And when it gets to zero, it will turn red. And when it turns to red and hits zero, that's your time to stop speaking. Uh, in order for this to be fair, uh, I will cut you off if you don't stop talking. I hate doing it, so if you can self-regulate, that would be great. Uh, another thing that's really important to this council, we know that um, there are many people here who uh, wanted this evening to be about tent city housing and homelessness. That's what the speakers uh, are indicating they'd like to speak about. As I've said, this meeting is also about all of the other business we need to do. Um, having said that, uh, this topic is a heated topic, or at least it can be. And so some ground rules that I would like everyone here to respect. Um, one is that these chambers are meant to be a place for respectful dialogue uh, and uh, a welcoming place for everyone. So if you could refrain from making comments uh, that incite any kind of uh, hatred or um, bad feeling or ill will, uh, we appreciate that. Um, we know that everyone here has something important to say. Um, this next part is actually really the most important part to me, I think, and to Council. Um, some people might be getting up and speaking here for the very first time, and if you're speaking for the first time in Council or in public and everybody claps, it feels great. But if you're speaking for the first time or even for the seventh or fifteenth time and people boo, it feels really terrible. And so we really want no clapping or booing. We'd like us all to just listen respectfully and quietly and take in the varied opinions that will be shared here tonight. So with that, um, I will ask Council to move the first five requests. Thanks. Moved by Councillor thornton Joe, seconded by Councillor Alto. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, our first speaker in this section is uh, Andrew Beckerman. Welcome. 
Mayor, uh, Your Honor, and Councillors, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Andrew Beckerman. I live at 1800 Chandler Avenue in Victoria. Uh, I've had a chance to speak with many of you individually and express both my gratitude and my frustration and what we are doing as a council. I've had a chance to speak with my MLA. I've had a chance to speak with my MP. Um, it saddens me that I don't have an initiative to bring forward to you, but uh, I do have a lottery ticket, and if I win the Lotto Max, I will have an initiative for 500 units of housing at our next meeting. Um, in, in looking at this problem, um, it strikes me that we can talk about this specific issue, the lack of housing, the lack of housing in specific for many of our most vulnerable citizens. But I think it's important to broaden the discussion to the reason of why we actually are facing this crisis. And um, I think that I'm certainly not in a minority in thanking the people who are residing in Ten City, if for nothing else, to bring this problem very clearly to the public's attention. Um, it would be nice if this was just a lack of housing. But it's a lack of housing that's conditioned on a lot of bigger societal issues. And as a volunteer at AIDS Vancouver Island, where we have a drop-in for people dealing with addiction challenges, I meet many people who are, in fact, homeless. Walking around downtown, I speak with people who are homeless and engaging in conversations with some of the people living in Tent City and in some of the temporary housing solutions that have arisen, I get to speak with people who are homeless. One common denominator is these are people dealing with major health issues that we as a society have neglected to deal with. And sadly, the, variety, the majority of them are mental health and addiction challenges, which even more sadly are brought about by things that happened to them when they were much younger and had no control over. And until we look at what we are seeing on the streets of Victoria today in a more broader setting, we will have people shuffling in and out of housing situations. I have friends who have gone on and off the cash list because they go into situations they cannot maintain because we have not addressed the underlying reasons that have them homeless in the first place. It pains me that my best friend for most of the time I have known him has been in and out of rehab and it hasn't worked and he's had more shots at rehab than anyone should be entitled to have but rehab as we practice it doesn't work and until we address this bigger underlying issue we are going to deal with we'll house the people who are homeless now but next year we'll have another batch of them. And I'm sad to say that as I sit at the desk at AVI, the age of the people coming in is getting younger and younger. There are people who don't fit in their communities, who don't fit in their households, and are being put out on the streets, either by the neglect of their parents or the abuse of their parents, or parents who are unable to provide parenting because of their own situations. And we really need to tackle this in a very um, encompassing way or we will just continue to recycle. And it's our responsibility to care for those who are needy. And it's our responsibility if we don't like seeing homeless people, what we need to do is build housing. You know, Everybody who moved into Mount Edward is no longer homeless. They are there. They're inside, and most of them actually stay inside because it's far more peaceful than the lives they formerly lived. And so we need to do the immediate as house people for the here and now, but we need to start looking at the bigger 
context that left people homeless in the first place. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Beckerman. Uh, next speaker, please, is Stephen Portman. Welcome. Thank you for that welcome. Uh, I'll just apologize at the outset. I'm, uh, I just ran here from James Bay. Uh, and anyone who uh, knows me knows I can't run very far uh, <laughs> on the best of days. So I'm a little bit uh, out of breath. Uh, but the good news is I probably won't fill five minutes. So thank you uh, for having me here tonight, Council, and uh, to staff, uh, and, and for everyone here. I, I've, I've spoken to Council a few times before. I always have something to come here and talk to you about that's very specific. I like to think that uh, the best way to use our time when we're working for the betterment of our community uh, to address bodies like this is to say, I really encourage this thing that you're about to do, or I caution you uh, for what it is that you're about to do and ask you to take it or adapt a different approach. I've never come to council before uh, without that agenda. And I don't often talk without an agenda. That's another thing that people who know me uh, know quite well about me. I don't have uh, much of an agenda tonight uh, in the way that I'm trying to influence any particular decision that you're making. Um, when I wrote the notes to guide my presentation tonight that I left at the fundraiser that I ran here from, <laughs> I sketched out uh, why am I here tonight if I'm not asking you specifically for that. Uh, and, and the answer very simply is I, I was told uh, when, when this agenda was first uh, announced uh, that there would be a, a large number of people here from our community tonight that were angry. Uh, and they were angry at a particular uh, group of people, a segment if you will in our community, uh, that experience a great deal of marginalization every day of the week for decades and decades in this community, and that this tonight could be a hotbed for that conversation. Um, and, and working as I do at Together Against Poverty Society for an organization that believes very deeply that we have to not only help and, and, and meet the immediate needs of low-income and marginalized people, but we need to advance those needs. And we need to work at systems change uh, so that we don't have uh, the byproducts of that, those symptoms of poverty uh, that plague the poor themselves and the community at large in the future. So I came initially when I signed up online to come here to speak to you, I, I came out of fear that a conversation would disintegrate in this chamber tonight, uh, that this space, that this air uh, would be used to continue what I have seen as a very negative, uh, destructive uh, and reductionary view of Tent City. Uh, two words I have never spoken so many times uh, in my entire life as I have over the last six months. The speaker before me laid out the context for why we have a tent city, I think in very clear terms. I'd add only uh, that we live in a province with the lowest minimum wage in Canada, the highest rate of, of poverty, with welfare rates that have been frozen for nine years in a city with a vacancy rate of 0.6%, where people, if they're lucky, enough to get on welfare and it's no easy task. We have a whole organization of paid staff just to help people fill out an application. If they, if they get past that door, they get $375 a month to pay for shelter in this region. That's why we have a tent city. We don't always have to have a tent city. The tent city that we have today will end. I don't think I've met or spoke to any group of individuals in the community of Victoria that has worked harder for an end to tent cities or an end to the systems that cause the need for tent cities than tent city itself. And, and, and I mean that and I, and I want people to hear that very clearly. Nobody in that tent city wants to live in a community that despises them. Nobody in tent city wants to live in a place where they are shunned for having potable water installed in their community. Nobody in Tent City wants to feel like they're threatening children, like they're threatening neighbors, like they're making people uncomfortable in their own houses. The people who live in those houses, the people who have felt insecurity and fear and anger and rage, and I've seen and heard a lot of it more than I, I'd, I'd ever thought I'd read in the last two days, they're right. They're right in so many ways, and, and their voice is important and must be heard insofar as that anger and that fear and that safety concern is used in a, rag, a, a rational and logical way to ensure 
that neighborhoods in this community will never have to face something like this again, and that the poor themselves will no longer have to be the victims of hate and discrimination, and that's what the people in Tent City are working for, and that's what I am working for, and the organization I represent is working for. Again, this Tent City will end. What will history say about this community when it's over? I hope it says we did the right thing. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Portman. Uh, next speaker, please, is David Maxwell. Welcome. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I want to uh, acknowledge the importance of the comments made by the speakers before me. So my name is uh, David Maxwell. I live at 2230 Shakespeare Street in Victoria. And I'm the chair of the Fernwood Land Use Committee, and it's in that capacity that I'm addressing you this evening. Thank you for providing our community with this opportunity to speak to you directly. I've provided you with a copy of my comments, just in case I leave something out. And I've left a lot of details out of, this, out of these brief comments, but I remain available to talk to any of you offline. So I'm here for two things. One, uh, request two things. One, that you consider sending a message about the way variances will be viewed when small lot developments are being considered. And second, that you consider allowing for exemptions in certain situations in the current garden suite policy. The Fernwood Land Use Committee currently has a policy in place where we do not support a small lot subdivision that requests a significant number of variances. And that policy is on the back of the piece of paper that I distributed earlier. We initially, we initially developed this position to give proponents a clear understanding of where they stood as where we stood as a neighborhood. This approach now makes even more sense as we see the escalation in the value of small lot developments. We believe that granting numerous and significant variances in order to create a small lot subdivision exacerbates this situation and goes against the original intent of the small lot house policy of providing an affordable housing option. Our request to consider making an exemption to the garden suite policy comes from our experience with a small lot rezoning application that will be coming back to Council shortly for the third time, probably at their June, your June 13th Committee of the Whole meeting. I will know more about where our community stands on this as we're re reviewing this rezoning application on Monday. But I think it's safe to say that while we don't support the request for a small lot subdivision, we do see value in additional housing, adding additional housing to this lot, and will continue to support a garden suite. This is where the problem is. The garden suite zoning does not allow for a secondary suite to also exist on the property. And in this case, there is a non-conforming up and down duplex on the property, two current rental units. Apparently, it is the original farmhouse and certainly a building of heritage importance. This is why we are asking you to consider an exception to permit a garden suite in certain circumstances. From the community's perspective, a garden suite in this location would be supportable for a number of reasons. It respects our ongoing concern regarding the request for significant variances to allow for a small lot subdivision, which could result in fitting a square peg into a round hole. Introducing a garden suite as an option provides an attractive rental housing unit, one that would likely meet the needs of a person with mobility issues. Now, it won't be an inexpensive rental but will add to the city's rental stock and therefore increase supply to a small degree. Unlike a rental house, it should remain long -term, a long-term stable rental as a unit can't be sold for redevelopment. And finally, it might also slow the escalation in land values where people speculate they might be able to get a small lot subdivision approved despite not meeting the requirements of the small lot zone. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Maxwell. Uh, next speaker, please, is Kira Kelly. Welcome. Thank you. Here, I guess I can start. You can start. Okay, I'm still new at this. Hey, my name is Kira Kelly. Um, probably recognize me now because I've been to a few of these and I feel like a broken record but I'm going to go through the same things about uh, things with homelessness, housing, tent city. So I'm here to put a face to the funding because 
I am going to be needing more and more help I am finding due to my change in my life circumstance. So this might give people an idea of the kind of needs people have, and which I've seen reflected in a lot of other people as well, who wind up in positions like mine. You think, well, why, why can't people just get their act together and, and not be homeless? And you know, what happened? What, what, what made them screw up their re-up? And this is why is um, my landlord is selling his house, surprise, <laughs> in September. So I have to move. And this is like the fourth time this has happened, you know, family moving in or landlord's use of property, basically. Um, so I, I don't really know what to do. I'm really scared. So obviously I'm looking for other options. The other thing that's happened is, so, well, with that, I'm not going to find a whole basement suite in the bottom of a house. Everything included, including laundry, internet, everything, for seven seventy a month. That's like a gift. And as well, I was working. Um, I'm on person with disability allowance, so I was working, making my eight hundred bucks a month, happy, you know, doing what I was good at doing. And I've wound up being plagued by very, very severe injuries, which have left me now to the point where I can't even sleep at night. I'm in so much pain. I've been quite dethroned, um, and so I'm winding up in a very bad circumstance very fast so I'm looking at all these different programs and whatnot that are available and uh, it's not working anyways I, I have it all up on here I had pictures but I guess I ain't gonna work now um, and the criteria for all these different programs to get into them don't fit me and that really I think is not fair for people not just me but also the people they do fit are people who wind up being severely addicted and having their lives completely messed up by the time they fit that criteria. So really, I think a lot of what's caused problems with homelessness and, and these types of crises, you can see there's housing, all this, but it's also the people that are supposed to be helping are not even available to help or there isn't even the resources or funding until people get to the point where they're totally messed up. I don't want to wind up in tent C. I don't want to wind up I have to be homeless when you're out of two and then have to have multiple contact with mental health and addiction services before I get help. And that's the criteria I think of the cash program. And then they get you into housing and get you a subsidized rent and whatnot. I have a rent subsidy. I'm needing a bigger one because of my expenses going up. So I've literally had my income cut in half. Because I, I don't have that $800 a month I can work for on um, my rents. I know at least it's going to go up 200 bucks with all my expenses. And utilities are part of rent, so you can't just say, oh, it's cheap because it's $800 a month. Well, no, add utilities, probably another $100 at least. So I'm looking at at least an extra $1,000. And I mean, I'm on 906 a month. I get my volunteer allowance, it makes it 1000 and six. But I mean, that's it. That, that's a pittance. And I have no idea when I'm going to go back to work again. So, you know, I've I'm feeling very stuck and like I say I don't want things to get worse before they can get better I'm on the edge why wait till I'm pushed over the edge to finally help me and people like me and seeing what our circumstances are and I've said this to lots of people and I mean in a way it's thanks to drugs I'm stuck where I am and marginalized because I was born addicted to drugs my birth parents are heroin addicts in the downtown east side of Vancouver so I didn't have a choice to muck my life up and I've been trying very hard to do the right thing and I don't smoke or do drugs, I drink very little, I've tried to make wise choices in my life and um, one big thing that I know this is really um, a hazard and a threat to people and why they're on the streets and you wonder why there's 80% of people are mentally ill on the streets, like hi, it's because of people who, we all know these types of people, they're predatory, they're sociopathic, they are wolves, I call them the wolves, who go after us, the sheep, people who have issues, problems, or down and out, or um, if someone's always fighting their, their headspace because of their mental disabilities, they are going to be more vulnerable to being manipulated and taken advantage of. And there's these people who target, these wolves, who target these sheep, and they take advantage of us. And they cause us so many problems where it can literally destroy a person's life. And there's been a few articles in Times Collins about it and different things. Guys who've had their whole businesses and then they tank because they got addicted to crack. How do you think that kind of stuff happens? It's because of the people. So there needs to be more prevention that way. And people need to just accept the facts and what's really going on and then tailor the services to what our actual needs are. And not just have this knee-jerk after-the-fact reaction where it's more too little too late. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is France Cormier. Welcome. Thank you. I love my neighborhood. It's quiet, residential. It's very safe and peaceful. It's very diverse in age. We have young children and families, 
young adults, middle-aged folks, and seniors. The children walk to school, and what a great special school we have. Parents walk to work. I may not know everyone that I pass on the street, but there are almost always hellos and smiles exchanged. That's the kind of neighborhood. It's also very economically diverse. It's subsidized housing, sits next to expensive condos. There's students, artists, professionals, retired people. There are detached homes, condos, apartment buildings, all styles. We have also housing for the homeless. There's tolerance and respect for everyone, and that's evident. Sadly, Mayor and Council, your actions and lack thereof over the last few months have seriously affected my neighborhood and the lives of those who live in it, not in a good way. In case you chose to ignore the ramifications of your decisions, I'm here to remind you that these decisions had consequences and victims. You arranged for a tent city to set up in my quiet neighborhood, one block away from the school. Before you deflect the blame on the province, let me say that in order to end tent city, the province needed your support. You didn't provide it. Rich Coleman said to the press after the Vic PD letter written to the province was leaked in April, and I quote, I don't want to get into an argument or a discussion with the city of Victoria. We did ask for things at the front end that they were not prepared to do that would have helped in the beginning. Since November, I've witnessed the homeless tourists arrive. I know what tourists look like because I see them all the time in my neighborhood. I've chatted with a few. All of them were for out of town. Many were given free transportation to come here by other municipal or provincial authorities. Since then, everyone on my street, including myself, have had their backyard robbed, many more than once. First time ever in my eight years in that neighborhood. I know you've heard some of the horrible things that the neighbors have had to live through, but you need to hear them again. <clears throat> Each of those incidents, and the many, many more, have real victims at the receiving end. A senior handicapped female attacked in broad daylight. A young man walking home brutally attacked because he looks like a skinhead. A man assaulted and robbed next to his apartment building. A woman threatened to have her home burned down. A man physically assaulted as he was walking on Vancouver Street with his wife. A six-month-old baby hospitalized due to smoke inhalation coming from the sacred fire. That was when he was in his own home. Blood is on your hands already. Neighbors have been assaulted. Ten city apologists may claim otherwise, but there is never, never an acceptable reason for violence. Now, I can no longer make eye contact with people I meet on the street because I don't know if it's going to be welcomed or if it will get me assaulted. For the first time in my life, I've witnessed people passed out, drug deals, and other illegal activities. And sadly, it's such a common occurrence now that I don't call the police anymore. I fear for the children at the school. You're playing Russian roulette with our children. People known to have erratic violent behavior do not belong in a residential area, and even less so next to a school. Yet you've allowed Tent City to grow here, and you want to house these same people permanently in my neighborhood 18 steps away from a school with children as young as three. That's way too young to be able to rationalize what they see. Finally, like in most places blessed with beauty and nice climate, jobs and housing are few and far between. Your actions have only exacerbated the issue. Mount Edwards was to become rental apartments. These apartments have been taken away from the market. Housing prices are a result of demand. <clears throat> Much cheaper housing can be found in other areas of the province and country. I personally left San Diego when it became too expensive for me to live in. That's what people do. I don't see why you are encouraging homeless people to relocate to one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. So I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to helping the hard to house. It's clear that they need our help, but it must be done reasonably. So here are my comments. I resent being used as a pawn for your extortion games. Your cavalier attitude towards the safety of Victoria residents is only creating a backlash, and that's very sad. You cannot co-locate numbers of hard to house folks in residential neighborhoods. Portland and Seattle's 10 cities are away from residential or downtown areas. They also have rules and expectations. We're not responsible for providing free room and board to each troubled person who lands in Victoria. I feel for those living and working here trying to make ends meet. They will need to pay more higher rents and higher taxes because of your social experiment. Portland is providing bus tickets to return homeless to their home state. Learn from them. Many other cities in the world have gone down the enabling route through low barrier housing and safe injection sites. It doesn't work. Learn from them. It costs almost a million dollars per day to care for Vancouver. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to proclamations. Uh, we have four proclamations, and I will ask Mr. Coates to read the titles of the proclamations, please. Uh, <clears throat> Sri Chinmoy Oneness Home Peace Run, June 24th. Men's Mental Health Awareness Day, June 14th. World Refugee Day, June 20th. And Access Awareness Day, June 4th. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Loveday. Is there a seconder for the proclamation? Seconded by Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you very much. We now move on to the public and statutory hearing portion of the meeting, and we begin this evening with the development variance permit for 360 Bay Street. I'm going to ask our planning staff to uh, explain for council and the public the matters under consideration this evening. Ms. Wayne. Thank you, Mayor Helps. This is a development variance permit application for 360 Bay Street. The proposal is to add 15 seats to an existing bakery and restaurant. The additional seats would require three additional parking spaces under the city's parking regulations. The requested variance is to reduce the parking requir requirements by three stalls. The matters under Council's consideration this evening are the acceptability of the requested reduction in parking stalls. Thank you very much. I will now invite the applicant forward for 360 Bay Street to make a presentation. And the applicant has 15 minutes to make a presentation to us. The timer is there and um, red or green, yellow, red, you can follow along. I got it, thank All you. All right, Mayor. welcome. Um, good evening, my name is Nick Crooks. Uh, my wife uh, and I, my wife Jodie Mann and I, um, many years ago started the Noodle Box restaurants. Our first one was just across the way in Chinatown. Um, we sold that place four years ago and just recently started Salt Truck Pie Company. Uh, we have a, a building on Bay Street in Rock Bay and it was it used to be an old Paradon computers store many years ago. It's a it's a neat black building, kind of a modernist deco architecture, and it, it was sitting empty for about two or three years prior to us taking it on. And uh, with uh, in conjunction with the building owner, we've invested a, a lot of money and we've we've made the space beautiful again and uh, breathed some new life into that corner. Uh, the the trouble we ran into was that we have the there's a flat roofed curved walled section at the front which is our little cafe space but because of that uh, the building has three tenants and it has eight off street parks and we needed uh, we, we got ten seats and we have the space and it really needs a few more so we've applied for this variance uh, what we've found we've been open for three months now um, what we've found is that we're in a very um, uh, industrial, uh, it's a very dense part of the city. Uh, we have a, a, a ton of workers right on our doorstep and uh, there's not a lot of places to eat. Um, there's the brew pub next door to us and that's about it. So we've found that since we've been open for the three months that um, we have a good little lunch trade and some breakfast business as well. And a lot of the people we're feeding are coming on foot. They're hardworking. They're a lot of blue collar jobs. There's the concrete facility. There's a lot of truck drivers. And uh, it's been a really welcome addition to the neighborhood. And uh, I think it would certainly help um, our business going forward for us to have the capacity to um, to seat and to feed those, those workers, uh, especially during that 12 to 1 o'clock uh, crunch time when everyone wants to get fed and uh, our, our business plan um, for our business is to have wholesale we have a, a fairly large we have a lot of square footage uh, but the cafe only occupies a very small amount of that so our, our plan is to to do the the model of savory meat pies if if anyone's been to New Zealand or Australia they're probably familiar with what a hot meat pie is and uh, our, our dream and our goal is to have a big production facility that, that wholesales those pies to other parts of the city. Um, but because it's kind of a new concept or at least a new, new spin on a concept, having those seats, having that, that cafe space enables us to, to get people hooked and uh, that's going to drive the demand and that's going to help our business. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor, are there any questions for the applicant? OK, seeing no questions, thank you very much. If there are comments or questions that arise during the hearing, we may call you back. 
So I will now uh, open the opportunity for public comment on the property known as 360 Bay Street. Uh, are there any speakers who wish to address this proposal? For a second time and for a third and final time. Okay, seeing no speakers, I will call the opportunity for public comment closed and I will ask Mr. Coates to uh, present the motion. And that's for council to consider uh, issuance of the development variance permit. So moved. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Any discussion? Yes, Councillor Isaac. This seems like a valuable addition to the neighborhood, and given that the public seems fine with it by their silence, um, I think we do have to be cautious in this area that we don't depart too far from the primary industrial use. I think industrial lands are important to the long term economic health of the community. Uh, but services ancillary to industrial employment, including food services uh, for workers and customers and others, uh, I think is valuable. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Loveday? Yeah, I also think this is an exciting addition to the, to the neighbourhood, and I, I, I hope that these additional seats help the business thrive. And uh, just looking at the menu to see if you have vegetarian options on the pies, I'd like, look forward to checking one out. Very good. Okay. Uh, further speakers? Okay. Councillor Thornton Joe, um, we all like pie. <clears throat> yes, and I, and, I, and I don't know if you know, as I think we're all checking out your menu at the same time, it's just, as I am as well. Um, definitely, I can su uh, support this, and uh, uh, we know, it, it, you know, I think the location is suitable. Um, it brings some vibrancy to that area. I know there's a lot of uh, workers that uh, love going, having a, a location close to that area, so uh, I think that will add to, to the area. and. I just want to say to the speaker that uh, a couple of us commented that we're disappointed the noodle box is no longer in close proximity to us. So I just want to add that. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing no further comments, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thanks for coming uh, this evening. We move on now to a uh, development permit with variance application for 943 Collinson Street. And again, I will ask Ms. Wayne in our planning department uh, to uh, outline for council and the public the matters under consideration this evening. Thank you. This is a development variance permit ap application to allow the construction of a triplex with two units fronting Collinson Street and one unit to the rear. The application proposes seven variances to the existing R3 AM1 zone which is to reduce the minimum site area from 920 square metres to 496 square metres, increase the site coverage from 30 to 40%, reduce the minimum required front yard setback from 9 metres to 7.10 metres, reduce the minimum required internal rear yard setback from 5.33 to 4.27, reduce the internal side yard setback from 5.33 to 3.68 metres, Reduce the minimum required internal side yard setback from 5.33 to 1.52 metres. And finally, to reduce the minimum required of off-street parking stalls from 1.2 stalls per unit to one stall per unit. And the matters under consideration are the supportability of the variances. Thank you very much, Ms. Wayne. I'm going to ask the applicant for uh, 943 Collinson to come forward. Welcome, staff, if we could set the clock for 15 minutes for the presentation. Yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, forgive my nervousness, I don't do this every day. Um, what we have proposed to do on Collinson Street is, uh, as you all know, and you've probably all driven by it, that's our 3 am one zoned property, an orphan lot. I originally proposed to put in something a little, a little bigger than should have been there. Uh, made uh, certainly made Tom Pemberton raise an eyebrow. So we just pulled the plug on it all together. We just didn't go there. Um, I've lived. Uh, I used to live years ago on Convent Street. It's a dead end road. This is a dead end road. This is very similar in, in all respects to where I used to live. I found it frustrating coming home at night and having to walk home. Uh, so what we proposed is is three units. Um, Two facing the street, one in the back, elevators in the two at the front, uh, what will appeal to everybody. Um, if you're older, you're, you can do that. There we go there, thank you, Michael. 
uh, surrounded by buildings on all four sides. Uh, the one that faces Fairfield Road is actually a, surprisingly a, the tallest of them all. It's got the hip roof. Across on the other side of Collinson, they've got lots of trees. There's privacy there. There is a small little heritage home stuck between the buildings. Um, the, if you go back one, there we go. Uh, we've, when we were here last time talking with you, there was talk about whether or not what we were going to do with the house. Um, you've probably read a letter that Nickel Brothers has been coming and going to, to this property for a year and a half because the owner at present has a particular sentimental attachment to it and he may well take this house away, but one way or the other, Nickel Brothers is going to take it. So I've been in contact with Jim. He's written a letter to you folks. Uh, it's a 1930 house. It's a 1,000 square feet. It has a plywood kitchen. If it was a beautiful heritage home in any way, shape, or form, I wouldn't touch it. Um, I guess that would explain that. Um, next, I guess. There's the, the buildings that flank us on, on both sides. The one up in the top left uh, has a, a grade difference of about a meter. And then you've got the one, the other one at the top right, which is our, our other neighboring building, and the one at the bottom left is directly across the street. They have lots of trees there, so they, they're not really looking at us. Uh, there's both of the ones that are in Fairfield Road. So this one here is directly behind us, 940 Fairfield, and then 936 Fairfield is the other one. Okay, there we go. Uh, to, to the left and the right, you can see the big trees that are there. Well, I should come. Some of the important things I should say to you is that we're going to retain all, as many of the big trees as we can on the property. So the big ones you see in the front stay. There's a couple of other ones will stay. Um, there's three big ones in the back that are going. I brought an arborist in, and I, I kind of thought maybe that uh, that would have been a, a stone unturned had I not. But the reason I brought them in well, a week ago was, was not to give me a letter to take them down. I was hoping I could keep one of the three. Um, but no. And then I talked to parks at the city, and they were already well aware that the trees have all been topped. I had no idea. Now, the, originally, uh, Scotty Tree Service told me there used to be a hedge. Uh, the fir at the back is dangerous. It's, it's in the letter that you've got there. He said it, you do yourself a favor and take it down because it's split. It's got a name for it. Um, all the trees on the back of the property. We'll, we'll retain as much as we can, except for those guys. Um, and a lot of the big shrubs will keep those as well. That's what we're proposing to do. Um, front yard, 23 feet back from the street. The house today, 17 feet. So we're actually going to go back. It's still not what the, you know, what the standard it requires, but we've pushed it back from the road. Um, I spent a lot of time going through all this stuff here, but I've been living with this for so long, I don't think I need my notes. Um, the side setbacks, so we tried to center it on the property, um, but essentially, as we work through, you'll, you'll see what we've, what we've got to show what our setbacks are. Um, elevators on both the front units living up on the top, uh, just so you can get some daylight. It didn't make much sense to have you living on the second floor. And, having people, everybody look, sort of looking down on you, and then you're going upstairs to sleep at night. That, that didn't quite add up. Uh, there's the east side of the property, uh, with the, actually with the trees that are there. That, in that picture, it shows them gone. There's a carport that runs the full length of that, of that property line. There's a, a retaining wall about a meter high on average. A four-foot fence sits on top of it, so when you're standing in the actual, on the actual subject property in the backyard, it's just slightly over 11 feet from the ground to the top of the carport. So it's, that carport will gobble up the first story. Uh, all the windows on the side are all up high, so the privacy, we've taken that into consideration for the neighbors. Uh, we've put solid walls on the sides of the decks. Um, the only windows here that really are sort of anything that you can sort of see. These little ones you see will be up high. There's a strip of glass coming down in the middle there. That's for the elevator shaft because although we want to put elevators in them, we, we don't want these confined uh, claustrophobic things. We would like to have something a little nicer than that. There's also windows in the stairwell at the front, but both of them are sort of not used rooms, shall we say. 
There's a couple of windows you can't see. They're down below, and they're egress windows for the unit at the back. Those, those we do have to get out of. This is just showing you the west side. So just coming down the side of the property, we've got a, a driveway that goes down the side, parking at the rear. Um, basically, there is a little light there. You can't really see it, but that'll identify the unit to the rear. It'll be a little bolder than that. Uh, that side of the property, uh, since the day the house was built, has had a driveway there, and there's a garage there now. So we intend to just sort of keep it that way. Grass down the middle of the driveway, as much green as we can. And I think that's about it for that. There we go there. The building on the on the right there is not a very good representation because it's not there, but it gives you an idea of what it'll look like from the street. Uh, site plan, basically bicycles in the front. Uh, sidewalks, which we will actually put little lights on them. The one sidewalk that cuts through that driveway we want to make it clear that where you're going, um, the one that's lower down, the bottom of the screen there, um, that of course will have nice lights on the sides of that, but I, thinking about it recently, I'm going to put some little lights into the other one that goes across the driveway just to identify that. Um, the backyard will be the property of the people that live in the lower suite, so they'll get a bit of a yard. The bottom left-hand corner, right to where the sort of this, the lower unit ends, there'll be a bit of a dog run there, so we'll put a gate there and allow somebody to and they'll just take and have their own yard. So a lot of the trees you see at the back are going to be retained. They're certainly going to be pruned, but they're going to be retained. And the, the trees, the larger ones you see up at the front, they're also going to be kept. Um, there you go there. So it, it gives pretty decent privacy. I mean, I know that seasonally they will change. Uh, the one up in the top left-hand corner is a, is a pretty massive good-sized tree, and uh, a bit of an ulterior motive to this, of course, is a developer, you really want to have all this mature stuff. You really want it to look like it's been there for 10 years when you're done. Um, a lot of the big plants you see in the lower uh, left-hand corner, aside from the junipers, according to Scotty Tree Services, don't waste your time with you. They're scraggly and they don't look that good, but there's a lot of big, beautiful ones there, and I'll, I'll do everything I can to scoop them up, ball them up, and put them in the back and protect them, because I'd love to put them back. I'm not sure how much council's 100% concerned with what's inside, but that basically shows you the, the two front units with parking, stairwells, elevators and storage lockers. At the back, you can see two bedrooms, two en-suites, um, patio and kitchen living, and uh, sort of a nice west-facing deck um, as well. Second floor uh, is actually, this is an interesting, and I'm not sure how often you folks see this, but it's just, it's bedrooms. So we've basically put the bedrooms on the second floor, and these are for the two front units, the larger units, and they sort of give a buffer effect between the unit below and the unit above. So there's sort of that bit of dead space there. And the bedrooms, the master bedrooms above and the masters below, by the way, are staggered. So they're not on top of one another. There's the top floor. Elevators all the way up. Uh, high ceilings and skylights. It should, uh, I think, be beautiful. Uh, the majority of sort of their living space will be the decks at the rear. Um, and we're going to put... Uh, plants along there and planters along there for privacy. Again, solid wing walls on the side, small windows for lots of privacy side to side. The glass will be, uh, you won't be able to read a newspaper through it, so we'll have uh, as solid a glass as we can get on the back. And uh, yeah, I think that that should do it. Roof just probably doesn't mean much to you, but you can see the, uh, again, the plants at the back we're using to sort of separate us from the rear. Uh, just a straight on shot of the front. Colors are not exactly what uh, the rendering shows, but all computers are different and it frustrates me. There's the rear of the building. Um, this you'll see when we get to it, it steps back. So we're asking for a 14 foot uh, setback in the rear, but you'll see that to work with that, the building steps towards the, the street. Um, not the best representation of it there, but there's all the small windows on the east. Uh, the solid walls on the decks, and again, you've got the windows in the elevator and the windows just at the front on the staircase. The two bigger ones down below are the bedroom. 
pretty much the same thing exactly on the west. Uh, interestingly enough, we're, we did, I did it intentionally. We're lower than all of our neighbors. Um, and I've got it in here, but essentially I, I did averages and stuff, realizing there's no way I'm going to be able to tell you half of what I've got. But we're about, on average, about three and a half feet lower than everybody else around us. Um, I can't really read it up there, but you can see the 14 feet, and then we step to 18, and then we go to 28. So we're, we're doing our best to lean away from that rear property line. We've had questions from the neighbors, uh, 936. Um, I know that they have felt and circulated a letter to the effect that we were going to come closer to the street and do all these things, but the fact of the matter is we're going to be back five and a half feet further back from the road than, than their four-story building. So I just wanted to let everybody see that. There may be some people that come to thinking that we are going to be way towards the street when, in fact, we will be a little bit back further than the, than the apartment building there. Uh, site plan again, just showing the existing house at 17.1, and we're going to we're going to push back to 23. So just to, to make that kind of clear, this is interesting. Parking uh, was my, my the two things that I thought about when I figured this would be the right way to go because of my own personal experience was parking and the front yard. I had some neighbors that wanted green. I couldn't give it to them any other way except to do this, so now we've got lots of green. Well, as much green as we could get. The parking, yes, we have three, we asked for three cars, we have three units, but I know that when I come home at night and I have an empty driveway and I have a driveway that's 80 feet long, I'm definitely parking behind my own car. So from a practical point of view, you could say we're, we've got five cars, and this is what I was thinking about. You will not be able to park in front of the garage that's closest to the east property line because you will not have, you'll be blocking access to the driveway at the rear. Um, as I notice, I'm running out of time. Um, there's been references to the Humboldt Valley design, and you folks all know this so much better than I do, but in every way, shape, and form, we can, I believe we comply with this in as many ways as we can, from the massing to the scale. Um, it, I've done my best to, to make it line up. And I guess if I get the chance to come back up here, here's the official community plan, which I've got back here. And you, you all know it, but it basically just states we are urban residential. Uh, and I read this after we designed the building. Low rise. That's what we're doing. That's our building form. Variable yard setbacks with primary doors facing the street. Variable front yard landscaping. Off-street parking and collective driveway access to the rear. We have it. Ground-oriented multi-unit residential. We have it. Low-rise multi. We have it. And floor space ratio 1.2. Don't even think about going to the big one and forget five stories out of your head. So I, I did that right away quick. So with 30 seconds to spare, um, I hope that, that you like it, and like I said, I've done, I've done my best to, to try and make it work for the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Before, you, you we, before we go to the public council, are there any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, seeing no further questions, we may have some if uh, questions are raised by members of the public. Uh, it's now an opportunity for uh, public comment on the property known as 943 Collinson. If you'd like to speak, please just come forward to the microphone. And for these uh, public hearings with regard to property, we do ask that you state your name and address so that we know how close you live to the subject property. Good evening. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Martin Young. I'm the president of the Strata Council at 936 Fairfield Road. So it's the property just to the east. Uh, you see the, the dotted line, dotted square, which is the property in question, and we're the one next door to it with the light-colored roof. Um, I just want to focus, uh, we've got a number of people who are going to talk, so I'm going to focus on one thing, which is the variances. The property zoning it contemplates a property lot size at 920 square meters with building coverage of 30%. This is in keeping with the local Humboldt Valley precinct plan. The idea is you have a large lot with a smaller building footprint, allows for greater setbacks for the building, room for trees, gardens, flowers, 
shrubs and grass. And it's in keeping with the neighborhood character and human scale development proposed by the precinct plan. The developer of 943 Collinson is asking for variances so it can build on a much smaller lot, 496 square meters, with a building coverage of 40%. When adding in driveway and parking spaces, the only real green spot will be a, a grass strip at the back, which he talked about, will have some trees, as well as he's, he's going to be chopping down some other trees. And uh, ironically enough, when he was explaining the development to us, he indicated that one of the selling points for his development will be my buildings, gardens, flowers, shrubs, and trees, because his, his two, two units up top will be facing our gardens. I'm concerned that the variances, when added up, amount to a de facto zoning change. As I've described, the variances are asked for, um, are designed, sorry, the, vari the, the zoning is not designed for a, a, a building on a, a large property. This is um, with, with minimal impact on setbacks and that kind of thing. Um, but what he's asking for is putting a, a, a large building on a small lot. I'm worried about this because Collinson is a street that has a mixture of apartment buildings and smaller single family houses. They work well together as an envelope, as, as a neighborhood, and uh, approving this development gives the green light to develop the other single family lots down the street. They are zoned the, the, with the same zoning uh, as 943 uh, Collinson. But if, co if council passes variances that allow these sorts of large buildings on small lots, with minimal landscaping, who's to say that another developer might come along and say, well, I need 40% or I need 50% or 60%. And uh, developers could turn Collinson from a tree-lined cul-de-sac to a mass of triplexes and, and quadplexes. So once the precedent is set, it's difficult to stop. I think council has to stick to its zoning. Huge departures should not be snuck in the back door via variances. Now, I do understand the need for Victoria to plan and allow for large expected increase in the population. Developments, developments need to respond to this growth are already underway. There's a large number of high-rise condos in the urban core. Lots of townhouse developments are springing up along major roads. And of course, infilling of lots is also a way to respond to this demand. However, I believe the proposal is too big and too massive to be appropriate for an infill for that property. I think the developer should be required to meet the zoning requirements. That may mean a smaller building, a duplex, or a larger single family house with maybe uh, an in-suite in, in uh, property. But, uh, and, and that would fit with the neighborhood and meet the precinct plan. So uh, I think, uh, yeah. So as for myself, I live in one of the units that only has east facing uh, windows. So the size of the proposed building means I will lose sunshine and be put into shadow, especially in the winter when the sun is low in the sky. I will lose privacy as my bedroom will be overseen by the, the, the west-facing units. And you notice how he's put the living part of the, his units up on the top floor because he talked about wanting privacy. Well, I'm going to lose my privacy. Um, and there's a number of uh, large evergreens that he mentioned that he's going to be chopping down and I will lose the privacy screen from the apartment building that he talked about that had the, uh, the carports as well. So I urge council to deny the variance the developer's asking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And did you state that you were the president of your strata council? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Patricia Morris, and I also live in 936 Fairfield. Um, I just wanted to the council to note that the Fairfield Community Association and Land Use Committee wrote to Charlotte Wayne, the planner, saying that the proposal is more like a rezoning than a variance, and that rezoning requires a higher level of scrutiny. The R3AM12 zone, the minimum lot size is 902 square meters. The developer is asking for massive variances to this lot to build his triplex. 
the lot size is 496 square meters, so that's a considerable difference. And we are very concerned about that becoming a precedent on Collison Street and throughout Fairfield. I just want to go through the zoning variances that have been requested by the developer for, for this development. Zoning rules require a minimum lot size of 920 square meters. This lot size is only 496. Site coverage should be maximum 30%. The proposed triplex would cover 40% of the lot. For three units, there should be 4.2, in brackets, four parking stalls. The proposal is for only three parking stalls. The front setback from the property line should be nine meters. The proposed setback is for only 7.347 meters. The west side setback from the property line should be 5.33 meters. The proposed setback is for only 3.68 meters. Now this setback is the one that's going to impact our building. Um, it's quite significant. It's going to really do a lot to overlook our building and also cut out the, um, the light from the sun in the first half of the day. The east side setback from the property line should be 5.33 meters. The proposed setback is for only 1.525 meters. The rear setback from the property line should be 5.33 meters. The proposed setback is for only 3.962 meters. So um, you can see why the um, Fairfield Land Use and Community Association uh, felt that way and wrote to the council with those concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Marjorie Benson, and I live in one of the units at 936 Fairfield Road. We also, uh, as does the Strata Council President, live on the east side, and uh, our only sunlight is from one side of our, our unit, and this development will definitely reduce that sunlight significantly. Um, I would just like to read from uh, some of the concerns that we have. The elements which define neighborhood character and human scale developments such as street trees and building massing are also valued. The mature street trees and public and private green space are highly valued as community amenities and contributors to the livable livability of this precinct. Park, parking variances may be considered subject to the provision of a parking study to the satisfaction of staff and subject to council approvals. Surface parking should be located to the rear of buildings or enclosed and should be adequately screened by landscaping. Where new buildings with minimal setbacks are proposed, consideration should be given to the relationship of the new building to its immediate neighbors, particularly with regard to shade and shadowing visual privacy, balcony locations, window alignments, and overlook. And I'd like to point out that the architectural um, plans that were shown on your screens show our building on the side as having no patios and no windows. <laughs> so it looks like there's just a solid wall that this building is facing, and of course it's not. We all have patios and windows on that side. And because of the height and volume of this building, we are all going to be left in the shade for most of the year, especially in the winter. Mature street trees are identified by the community as an important neighborhood characteristic. Retention of these mature trees is st strongly supported. The impact of new buildings, and in particular reduced setbacks on street trees should be assessed as part of the development. I would just like to end uh, what 
I am saying by this um, project is also a very high-end project. These units will probably sell for a million dollars or just under a million dollars each. And our building is still providing affordable housing for people who can maybe only get into a condo development, maybe cannot afford a house. We're in the 300 plus thousand range in our condo building. This building will be attracting only three very high-end buyers. And I, I personally feel that it is not a good use of space um, for that particular area. You're taking out a small home which looks appropriate and reasonable on that lot and putting in a, 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 a structure that is so high that it, even though it's just a triplex, it needs an elevator. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen too many duplexes or triplexes with elevators in them. So that's all I would like to say for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Margaret Feige, F-E-I-G-E. And uh, I also live, and uh, my husband and I live in 936 Fairfield Road on the third floor. And we also have our unit, all the living area, living area, the dining area, the bedrooms. All of our windows on the east side will look out on this massive new building. And I, I really have a really hard time with the size of the variance for this, on the lot size. It's almost 50% less than what's required by the current zoning regulations for our neighborhood. And it just seems like it's just such a huge amount for, um, you know, to approve that large of amount, especially when, if you're required to have a lot size that's 900 and some, um, then it seems like the developers should be looking for a lot that size and would make a much better living environment for the neighborhood for everybody on all sides of that new building. And it's not that I, I don't mind if, it, if it's something that reasonable variances that would fit into our neighborhood and, you know, like a smaller duplex or especially the sing, or single family home obviously is beautiful. We have that lovely landscaping we look out on the trees and, and the loss of light is just going to be, I think, a big detriment to the quality of life for all of us living in 936 Fairfield Road. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. For a second time. And for a third and final time. Okay. Seeing no further speakers, Council, are there questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Loveday, Councillor Thornton Joe, and then I have one. Go ahead, Councillor Loveday. Question to city staff. I'm wondering. <coughs> At what point, when there, at what point, do variances trigger uh, the need for a rezoning? Yes, to answer that question, anything related to land use or density triggers a rezoning application. In this particular case, the ap uh, application is within these uh, floor space ratio allowance, which is 0 0.9 floor space ratio. So it is within the allowable density of the zone, and the use is permitted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, my question is to the applicant. Um, th there was, has been mentioned a couple of times regarding the elevator, and, and we very rarely see this, this few suites in, to have an elevator. So what prompted you to add elevators, and is there elevator shafts that exceed the, the height as well? Uh, the elevator basically uh, what it does is allows uh, you to live where, where I believe you should. You should have skylights in your living room. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I did this back in the early 90s. I built a house in James Bay, and it didn't make any sense to me. I, I found out where I was going to be. I got up on a ladder, and I thought, this is ridiculous. Why am I going to put my master bedroom up here? Why wouldn't my master bedroom be on the second floor, and why wouldn't I sit up here with my friends and enjoy the view? So to me, it just made sense to have the bedrooms down below. I, I did this at, on 277 Michigan Street. Interesting thing with the heat as well. It's a little warmer upstairs, and in the middle of that staircase, when you're halfway down, your bedrooms are cooler. 
In this particular instance, there's going to be residents on the ground floor, so there is these bedrooms between, but it really just has to do with, with people not wanting to walk them. It's not bad walking those stairs when you're at a certain age, but as you get older, and, and also as you have, when you have groceries. So, so walking is not so bad, but humping your groceries up there is, is a bit of a chore. So they're, they're a little pricey, but they're a real advantage, and I think it just makes for nicer living space. So it just to, to have your bedrooms up on top like that, it, it just, it's a personal choice of mine, but it just seems nicer to live up on top and have your sleeping down on the second floor. That's the answer to your question, I think. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for the applicant, and then I'll go to Councillor Alto. Um, we heard from the uh, the folks at 936 Fairfield um, about the privacy and lack of sunlight impacts. So I'm wondering if you could just tell us um, what efforts you made um, to mitigate um, overlook through windows into their windows. If you have any pictures of window alignment or the yeah, efforts. we we basically um, we don't have any real windows to speak of on either east or west side. We've got all little windows. We've got ten foot ceilings. The reason we have that is we wanted to pull the building up a little bit so it didn't look kind of like a runt. We wanted to look like we fit in consistency and have some kind of harmony there with the buildings flanking us. The windows we have are all quite high up. They're, they're, we'd call them piano windows if they were three feet long, but they're little little cube windows. They're all up high. We have 10-foot ceilings. All the little cube windows, which are going to be about two feet square, well, they will be two feet square, you're going to have to reach for them. So we will not be looking at them, and they will not be looking in at us. And the only windows that we do have are in the elevator shaft and in the stairwell. Those are the only windows of any substance. That's actually not true. There is windows in a little bit of a hallway up there as well, but that's right outside the elevator. So we, we've done everything we can. Um, Charlene has mentioned it a couple of times, and at the very end said, you know, take, get these windows out. We had windows in the living room. So we don't have any, any. We can't sit and look out at them. Okay. Thank you very much. My next uh, and final question is for yeah. staff. Um, in one of the letters we received on this application, there was a, a suggestion that it was the city's policy that all buildings along Collinson Street should be the same height or all new development should be the same height. And the letter asked for clarification about that. So can you clarify, do we have a policy uh, around that or what, what would you say to that query? So the, um, the application does have a number of variances. Uh, height is not, not one of them. Um, the application is within the allowable height limits of the zone. Um, and added to that, uh, the Humboldt Valley Precinct, precinct Plan um, does allow buildings up to four storeys in this location. So it is consistent with both the zone and the policy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Could, would I be able to make one quick response to that, very quickly? Uh, I've been to, back to the Strata Council twice, had two meetings. Sir, actually, sir, you know what, I asked, I, no, just fair enough, procedurally fair I have to be fair, so I the understand. question was to staff, yeah. but Councillor Alto might have a question for you. Councillor Alto. <laughs> I actually have a question for staff. Um, I think you may have answered it partially, um, but uh, I just wanted to explore the notion of if, if the variances uh, were not approved, what could be built there? I understand now that you have a the capacity to build up to four stories instead of three, but typically what else could be built there? Yes, I think um, in the um, staff report, um, we do say that um, technically the property could be developed up to a density of 1.2 to 1 mm -hmm. FSR. Um, with a maximum of four storeys and with all the uses proposed. Alternatively, a duplex or a single family dwelling with secondary suite uh, would be allowed. Thank you. Actually, I do have a question for the applicant. Uh, the um, inclusion of elevators suggests that you've created three storeys of accessible living. Are there other accessibility features in the design, or is it just the elevators? Just the elevators, and again, um, and we've got one unit on the ground at the back. But it also has units of some size. So if we're looking at a mix, we're, we're, we're the only townhouses on the street, and it allows people that are older to move there as well. And if, and if I could just quickly respond to that one thing, where they, when I went and met with Strata, and, and I made a comment about consistency and harmony, and th this is like the three bears. This has got to fit. 
And then I said, let me retract that statement. In a room full of people, I said, I'm not going to speak on behalf of a dozen planners and a dozen council members. So in front of a group of people, I took that statement back. I said, I, I, don't, I don't know what they're going to think, but generally the policy says this. So just so you know, it, it, it wasn't heard, but the, but the other eight people that were in that room would have certainly heard me retract that statement about the height of the building. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council, are there any further questions? Uh, Councillor Madoff. Uh, one through you to the applicant, actually. Um, we've heard about um, the neighbours to the, to the west, and there were comments about uh, overlook and, and, and loss of privacy, and, and that doesn't seem to be the case because of the placement of the windows on your proposed building. But in terms of neighbourliness, and acknowledging their patios and their windows and their desire for light. Can you explain why, how the variance that you have requested uh, addresses those issues? Well, we actually, we, we did, we brought it with us. I don't know if we'd want to st stick it in the computer, but we, we, we didn't know when a shade study was never mentioned to us, but we certainly did one. And uh, throughout all times of the year, we brought it with us if anybody wants to see it. We didn't ask to put it up, but, but it's not going to impact them greatly, the sun. Not according to, not according to the, the computer, it's not. So I, I, I've been sensitive to the fact of all of this, and this is why I didn't, you know, I kept the building lower and pushed the building back and tried to keep it down to a dull roar, thinking of, thinking of the neighborhood, you know. And my second question would be that um, recognizing that you're, the site that you have to work with is, as was pointed out, almost 50% uh, smaller than what would be contemplated for this kind of development. Was there an attempt to actually respect the, the variances in terms of the setbacks? We did. We absolutely looked at that. And a lot of this, you know, this size is a typical orphan lot. And I know that people feel that down the street, this may happen again, but all those houses down there, they can barely park a motorcycle. They're 2,500 square foot lots, so we, well, there's no place for us to go. We, we have a lot with buildings all around us. We certainly looked at, um, at what we would have with the other, trying to make it different, and it just didn't seem to fit. Now, you know, I really got to say that I didn't want something to look silly either. That, that's really how I felt. I felt like I didn't want anything to be four feet taller than everybody else, and I, I certainly didn't want it to be, you know, four feet less than everybody else. But we certainly did look at it, and it was the, the two big things were parking and, and, and front yard, green space. We never did get to the green space, but we, I think we've done a little better than we, we thought we would. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see no further questions, so I will not, oh yes, do you have a question? Sure, uh, Councillor Alto has requested that we see the shadow studies. Yep, sure, Mike, if we can put it in. So just give us a moment to get those in. For everyone's uh, information, I'm Michael Moody. I'm the architect for the project. There's the three separate studies. We did one for the um, for the equinox and the summer and winter solstices, which are pretty much the most severe, you know, uh, daylight times. Um, I think the most important fact is that we're on the east side of their building and we're lower. Um, that in itself um, is significant. Uh, the, most of the sun blockage is actually being done by nine, uh, the building to the west. So just walk us through the, sh the shadow study. Okay, so the March and September 21st, um, I should have done individual. And if you could thoughts. orient us uh, towards what is what. Okay, so we're facing the project from the northwest. Um, uh, the building 
On the right-hand side is the building which most of these people live in. Um, it's several feet taller than the proposed building. Um, I think what you can, if you can see this, the shadows. So, sir, sir, you have to stay at the microphone because there may be yeah. people watching Sorry. that aren't here yeah. that need to hear you. The shadows at the, the equinox um, don't even touch um, the adjacent building. Um, this, uh, oh. Is that actually being moved by me? There we go. So at 11 o'clock in the morning, um, you can see that uh, the shadows fall pretty much at the base of the building. Uh, one o'clock, am I actually doing that? Oh, okay. So at one o'clock, um, I mean, it, it just gets progressively away from their building. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, the equinoxes are the same in March and September. Um, we should probably go to the, um, to the next slide, if we can. So the summer solstice, which is in a week or so, June 21st, is that, yeah, there we go. Can we, is that me clicking on that? Okay, so um, again, there we go. Um, in the morning, the shadows are falling pretty much on the ground and as we progress through the day, it's, it just becomes, if I can use the word irrelevant, um, uh, it doesn't affect the adjacent building. Uh, I understand their concerns, um, but it's, it's just not accurate. Their building will actually be causing more shadows on the proposed building. And the winter solstice it just makes the case even uh, more relevant. Um, the shadows are low, obviously, um, and they're coming. Well, can we click on that, please? On the, yeah, the winter. So um, I don't think there's a point really. I mean, I think at 11 o'clock in the morning on a winter day, you can see some shadow casting on the front of the building on the right-hand side there. And then it just, again, becomes irrelevant. Um, there was a comment made about the trees being removed from the east property line. Um, those would never cause any shadows. Um, they, they may cause, uh, they may create a, a screen right now, but I think in time that the trees that we're, we're planting will reach maturity and uh, increase uh, the green space. Thank you very much. Council, are there any further questions? Yes, uh, Councillor so, Young. Sorry, uh, they all seem to start at 11 a.m. Did I miss the 9 a.m. views? I didn't actually do any at 9 o'clock, I don't think. Uh, I brought my computer, we could do one, but... Uh, We're not going to get that technical. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Council, are there any more questions? Okay. Seeing no further questions, I'm going to call the opportunity for public comment closed. Uh, ask Mr. Coates and team to present the motion. And that's for council to consider authorizing the issuance of the development permit. I did ask Mr. Coates what happens if no one moves a motion. I'll, I'll move that the application be received and filed. Okay, is there a seconder? Second. Okay, seconded by Councillor Madoff. Uh, there, go ahead, Councillor Isaac. There's clearly a lack of public support as well as council support. Uh, for this application based on input received. I think councillors used to say we're not in the business of protecting views or sunlight, but I think um, clearly the people who live next door feel this isn't supportable. It doesn't mean that opposition amounts to some kind of absolute veto, uh, but I think compared to other applications of similar density and massing, uh, more work on the part of the applicant likely could have produced greater support. Um, at some point, there may be densification of this property, uh, but I don't think it's uh, supportable to densify along these lines in the face of the considerable uh, opposition from the people who have a, a major stake on the street and in this neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Madoff, do you wish to comment as the seconder? And then I'll go to Councillor Young and then to myself. 
Yes, thank you. I've certainly given this one very serious consideration and appreciate the input that we've received. Um, I just was truly troubled by the extent and number of the variances. Um, even if there had been one significant variance that had been mitigated by responding to the, the requirements in terms of setbacks and that kind of thing, I think we might have ended up with something that would be seen as, as quite supportable. But certainly the site area alone, uh, in terms of uh, the 920 square meters that is, is what's required in the zone and the 496 that exist, even if one was to work with those numbers, my expectation would be that the setbacks at least would have been um, respected. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Young. Uh, yes, it, clearly, I, I was interested in the in the um, staff response to the issue about um, variances versus rezoning and and the and the view of the uh, community association. Obviously, what what we have here is a situation where. A zoning that was intended for um, a, a much larger lot is applied to a very small lot, and it obviously creates a difficult situation because um, we have an area that is designed for a certain density, and and many buildings uh, are built within that density, but there remain. Uh, what you might call these these orphan lots, um, sometimes left over from other um, land accumulations, uh, sometimes very old uh, properties, and and of course this street does have some even smaller lots down toward the west the west end. Uh, but what happens, of course, is that when the density is is squeezed onto a a, a lot that's much smaller. Uh, the setbacks get get very small, and I, I I have to say to the neighbors, it is not realistic to expect that there will always be a low building there, and that there'll be that uh, variation in height uh, that some people uh, obviously enjoy seeing, because uh, I think there will be more density on this on this lot, uh, but because w where it has. Obviously, what gave in this situation was that the building was pushed out uh, close to the lot lines, and uh, all of those um, setbacks were reduced. And that is is a is a situation where where I think we do have to respect uh, the concerns of the neighbors who will be affected, and who are on their lots in some cases are providing the dis the distances between the buildings that make the may make the street livable, but. Um, I think um, it, it I, really it is unfortunate when uh, that these um, uh, orphan lots are left over and and um, sometimes our staff tries to avoid them happening. But really, um, we can't we can't control how property is developed, and when they exist, uh, they do create difficult situations. But uh, unfortunately, it's up to the the developer of those lots to try and and find a solution that that will uh, fit with the neighborhood as it exists, uh, while sometimes trying to achieve uh, a greater density that's more consistent with uh, the buildings around it. Thank you. Um, I feel similarly to many of my councillor colleagues, uh, and the words that really struck me in the presentations this evening were human scale development. Uh, I think that's important to have human scale development. Um, I, I think it is, it's an odd orphan lot with zoning that uh, is, it's there probably to at one point have been consolidated with other lots, maybe even 936, I'm not sure of the history. So I think something like a, a duplex uh, would work well here and uh, hopefully the applicant will, um, uh, if this fails, uh, actually, I guess the motion is to receive and file, so regardless uh, that the applicant will take that seriously and uh, work a little bit harder to fit in with uh, with what the neighbors expect. And just for everyone's information, a motion to receive and file simply means that if this passes, we will receive this, and that's the end of the story on this application, just for clarity. Um, are there anyone else, any other speakers? Councillor Alto, then Councillor Loveday. Just a question to staff. Um, 
Uh, what what are the rules around when an application can be brought again if the application tonight is received and filed? So if um, the applicant wanted to uh, come in with the identical application, it would be a time of 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, however, if the applica applicant wanted to come in with a completely different proposal, for example, for a duplex, he could do that tomorrow. Great, thanks, Chuck, for clarifying that. Um, yeah, I, I share some of the concerns, uh, but not all of the concerns of my colleagues. And the reason I asked the question earlier about what could be built there without uh, resorting to as many variances, you know, I, I think that what will happen is, I suspect that what will happen is that at some point this will be developed with something that's taller uh, and more slender, uh, so that you won't have this feature of having to be pushed out so far uh, towards the uh, towards the lot lines. And I actually am okay with that. I think that what I've been hearing is a real discomfort with the degree to which the building itself uh, verges towards the edge of the lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps if the design was, you know, a bit narrower, a bit taller, uh, even with a bit more density as is allowed, it might have had a different response. But I don't believe I'll be able to support the, I will be able to support uh, the motion that's on the table and I wouldn't have been able to support the application as it stands uh, because I think it, doesn't quite suit the uh, the lot that it's sitting on for many of the reasons that have been stated before. It's a troubling lot. It's going to take a real a unique design to make it work, uh, and I'm hopeful that that unique design will be forthcoming because I do think that there is a need uh, to have greater density in, in this area, and you know this is just typical of some of the challenges that are ahead as we try to fill in uh, some of the oddly shaped orphan lots that are around the city. So I'm hopeful the application will return, uh, and that at that time we'll be able to. Uh, uh, consider it more favorably. Thank you, Councillor Loveday. Yes, I also wouldn't have been able to uh, vote in favor of the application, uh, although I do think that somewhat uh, increase of density in, on this site makes sense. Um, and I was also happy to see that the idea was to move the house instead of demolish the house. I think that's that was an important factor for me. Um, because I think demolitions are a growing issue in our city. Uh, dis despite that, um, and what I thought was a great presentation by the applicant, I think the variances are just too great. Um, and I, I do expect to receive uh, another application for this site uh, soon. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further speakers, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. That will be received and filed. Thank you for coming and speaking with us this evening. Uh, we move on now to a development variance permit application for 1535 Davy Street. And once again, I will ask Ms. Wayne to walk through for Council and the public the matters under consideration this evening. Thank you, Mayor Helps. This is a development variance permit application that involves two variances for the purposes of constructing an addition to an existing triplex and this would allow uh, the conversion of the building into a single family dwelling with a secondary suite. The two variances are to increase the maximum area of the first and second storeys combined from 280 square metres to 284.4 square metres under the R1B zone, and secondly, to increase the maximum enclosed floor area added to a building when installing a secondary suite from 20 square metres to 115.1 square metres uh, under Schedule J of the zoning bylaw. The matters under consideration are the supportability of the variances. Thank you very much, Ms. Wayne, once again. I will now invite the applicant for 1535 Davie Street to come forward. Welcome. Hello. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to address the council today. Um, my name is Danu Stinson, and along with my mom, Gail Anthony, and my husband, Nick, and our two children, we are going to be the residents of um, 1532, Dave, 1535, Davey, um, hopefully, if this is approved. Um, so we've been looking for a long time for a property where we could save an old house, basically, that needed a lot of love, and we found that in 1535, Davey. Um, it's an old house that is in uh, a state of considerable disrepair. Um, and we are um, hoping to make that into our family home by uh, restoring it and 
saving it with a lot of uh, extensive renovation and structural, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason that we're here today is that we also want to build um, an extension onto the home to create um, somewhere for my mom to live with us so that we'll have a multi-generational home um, there. So this is the property, and um, it's a large property. As you can see, the house has a relatively small footprint for the neighborhood. I believe it's somewhere around 950 square feet is the footprint of the home. Um, so with our addition, the full footprint of the new space will be smaller than a lot of the neighboring homes as well, as you can see just looking at the roofs that many of the other houses are um, quite a bit larger. These are some images of the house. They look It looks better from the outside than it actually is, as we discovered as we started touring the house um, more recently when we got possession. Um, it's presently covered in vinyl siding, and we're going to take that off and restore what we hope is the wood siding that's, well, we know the wood siding is underneath, and we hope we can restore it. Um, there's sort of an image from the front. There's lots of greenery on the property, and we're not going to be removing any of it except I think there's one rather old um, apple tree in the backyard that, we'll, that we will remove, but all of the other greenery will be remaining um, on the property. Um, here you can see an aerial view of the extension. So the main house is there on the left, and as I said, that's about a 950 square foot footprint. Um, and the addition in total has a roughly 620 square foot or 700 square foot footprint um, on the back. Um, some of that um, is going to be space for the main house, um, a mud room, and also stairs leading from the main floor to the basement. They were removed many years ago, so we're going to put those into that addition space. Um, I believe that it was mentioned that the, the um, secondary suite will be 115 square meters, but that's actually the full size of the addition. Only ni uh, 90 square meters of that will be the secondary suite, which, as I said, will be occupied um, by my mom. Um, this is um, a side view looking at the house from the south, and there's quite a few windows of the existing house there's on the left and the extension on the right. And there's quite a few windows, but that um, is set back very far from the neighboring property. So, And there's also a lot of greenery on the neighboring property, and their house is a, um, a bungalow, so there's no um, overlooking of the windows on that side at all. Um, and the other side, you can see on the um, addition, we've only got two um, small windows, one th that's on the door and one in a hallway upstairs. So there's, we've made an effort to make sure that there's not a lot of pr um, issues with privacy with the part that we're adding to the house. Um, in addition, um, our neighbor's house does, on that side doesn't um, go beyond the back of the main house anyway. So the addition is sort of in the yard area. This view also shows how we've um, made the addition step down so that once we have our privacy fence installed and we're putting you know nice tall privacy fences on both sides of the property the um, the only part that will really be visible from the new addition will be the um, two-story section that's closest nestled in next to um, our part of the house and there's some interior plans that um, sort of show how we're planning to use it um, I'm gonna leave it on this one so um, all told, there's going to be between five and seven people, members of our family, living in the house throughout the year. Um, our, my husband and I and our children will live in the main house, and then my mom in the extension. Then we have two additional family members who live with us for multiple months of the year who will also spend some time there. Um, and during the process of developing our plan, we've consulted extensively with our community. Um, my mom attended the South Jubilee Community Association meeting back in April and talked to everybody there. And we've also um, gone door to door, and I believe that we were able to speak to about 15 different um, neighbors about our plans about the neighborhood. Um, they were all really good conversations, very friendly. We were happy to meet a lot of our neighbors, and we learned a lot of gossip about the street. Um, um, generally, people were quite pleased we weren't going to tear down the old house that's there. It's been there. It's one of the older homes on the street, and I think they were happy to see that, and we're, we're happy to do that as well. So, um, yeah, so we're putting up the privacy fence and greenery as well to make sure that um, it's a pleasant to look at for our neighbors as well. So we've made every effort to respect their privacy as well. So we're happy to answer any questions that you might have, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, are there questions at this time? Okay, uh, there are no questions. There may be questions that arise uh, after the 
opportunity for public comment. So it is now an opportunity for members of the public who wish to, to come forward and comment on the application for 1535 Davy Street. And for a second time, and for a third and final time. Okay, no speakers, council questions? No questions. Uh, I will call the opportunity for public comment closed, and I will look to Mr. Coates to present the motion. And that's for council to consider issuance of the development permit with variances. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Madoff, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Discussion? Councillor Madoff? Thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to support this application. I was in attendance um, as the council liaison at the South Jubilee Neighborhood Association meeting where this was considered. There were no issues that were identified at that time, and I think as the applicant has indicated, there was a, a great deal of support for the old house being retained and refurbished for respecting the character of the street and uh, the opportunity for the neighbors uh, to welcome a new family as well. And I have to say in the, in the presentation, um, I was very moved by the statement of save an old house that needs some, needs some love because that's really what most of these houses need rather than a bulldozer and demolition. And I really applaud you for, for taking this on. I think it's gonna be a fantastic home for whomever lives there over the, over the years, but, but certainly from an environmental point of view, from a neighborhood point of view, from an architectural point of view, it's gonna be fantastic to see this house being given a new life. Thank you, any further speakers? Okay, uh, Councillor Alto. Uh, just briefly, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. It was a very refreshing presentation. And uh, echoing Councillor Madoff's comments, it's uh, delightful to see someone take an interest in uh, taking the bare bones of what was once a great house and bringing it back to life uh, for not just your generation, but generations to come. So thank you for that investment in our community. Okay, with those accolades, uh, I will call the question. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, council members of the public, we're going to take a five-minute recess, and they will, then we will move on to the next section of requests to address council. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Council, I would like to call the meeting back to order. Um, and we are now at the second portion of the requests to address Council portion of the meeting. Um, for those who have been here since the beginning, you're going to need to hear my long speech again about what, what's, how this works and what we do. Um, and for those who weren't here, this is mostly for you. So this is an opportunity for members of the public to address Council. Uh, it's not an opportunity for a back and forth between uh, council and the public. If there is a councillor who uh, hears something that you've said and wants to follow up later uh, with you, they will. Um, each speaker has five minutes. There's a clock. Uh, when you get up there, it says five minutes and it's green. When you get to one minute, it turns yellow. When you get to red, uh, it is zero. Zero is red. And at that time, it is time for you to stop speaking. And, and as you've noticed, I'm very firm with that uh, so that it's fair for everyone. Uh, as I also said earlier, um, these chambers are meant to be a place for respectful dialogue where everybody feels welcome and uh, we are going to make sure that that is the case. Uh, to that end, um, if somebody uh, is up there speaking for the first time and everybody claps, it feels great. If you're speaking for the first time or even the seventh time or the fifteenth time uh, and people boo, after you speak, uh, it doesn't feel very good. So for that, uh, to that end, council requests that there's no clapping or booing. Um, there are obviously lots of strong opinions uh, on this topic, and, uh, and we, they're all welcome here as long as they're expressed respectfully and we just listen and, and don't react. Um, so with that, uh, council, there are 20, uh, one, 22 requests, and I will ask that those be moved. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Isaac. Uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. So our first speaker in this portion is Bob Lysavik. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, thank you, City Council, for allowing me the opportunity of addressing you this evening. My name is Bob Lysavik. I live in, in James Bay and use the Y. 
The title of my message is Ten City, a Flawed Legal Process. The main problem with the Ten City fiasco is that all of the province, Victoria City Council, and the court have followed a flawed legal process. Here's how. Number one, the occupation by Ten City in the courthouse site is a very clear case of trespassing and illegal occupation of land supplemented by illegal activities. The court has not adequately addressed the issue of enforcing law and order in its own backyard. Rather, the case and public discussions have been dominated by broad discussions about social housing and availability. The court's ruling also implies that those who flagrantly break the law at the expense of others are able to call upon our Charter of Rights to justify their illegal behavior. Number two, a very basic principle of law has been astonishingly overlooked in the court process. Not all parties interested in the court case were before the courts or adequately represented. The obvious omission is the Christchurch Cathedral neighborhood, the other side to this case, supported by the vast majority of the public who have consisted, consistently opposed the 10 city occupation. Their legal rights, including their charter rights to security of their person and their property has been denied to favor the 10 city occupiers. The solution is for the province to rectify all of these mistakes and to appoint at the province's expense an independent legal counsel to represent the neighborhood as an interested party in any further court proceedings related to 10 City. Incredibly, a routine matter starting with one lone trespasser has ballooned into a court case of 69 affidavits, 69 affidavits, and perhaps more to come. Small wonder that access to our courts is so out of reach of the ordinary people by reason of the exceptionally expensive processes imposed upon them and the extremely difficult requirements of proof ordinary people must subsequently follow to protect their legal rights. Number three, a practical suggestion. The stated objective of both the province and the city of Victoria is to dismantle the tent city and remove the occupiers without towards restoring the land to its original state. The province, city, and housing authorities could adopt a simple plan to speed the process. When one resident leaves the tent city location, that person is not replaced. My concern about the suggestion of one leaving, nobody returning, is that the idea is so simple, it may be above everybody's head. Citizens of Victoria and area, I leave you with questions you and your communities may have to answer sooner than later. Question one, considering the recent track record of establishing social housing in Victoria by the civil disobedience route, can you trust the responsible authorities in the future to act in your best interest when any form of social housing is designated in your community. Question two, has the time come to establish in each community a new kind of neighborhood watch? One that watches out for what 10 city occupation or social housing initiatives may happen in your parks or in your community without you otherwise not knowing about it. Thank you, Council, once again, for allowing me the opportunity to express my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Alison Acker. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors, and uh, a very respectful audience. I'm very glad to see how well we're behaving ourselves, and I hope this continues. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, th 
I've been a supporter for Tent City. And in fact, I think we should all be thankful for the people who set up Tent City because by this, we have opened up the taps and actually got some money coming in, rolling in from um, the CRD and from the province and probably from, um, from Ottawa too. Without tent cities, we'd be, we'd be just going along. Nobody would notice when people are sleeping in the street on Fort Street. Um, it's when the people who are poor and uh, many of them disabled, etc., cetera, and are in disadvantage, go right in people's eye by setting up in, um, uh, in the space by the law courts. It's only because of that that things are advancing. So I think they deserve a word of thanks. Okay. Um, I'm sorry that people have such fear. I'm 87. I go to the tent city about once at least, once a week at least, most often twice. I've never in, remotely been threatened by anybody in the tent city or anybody down the side. Um, as I see it, most of the present residents are walking wounded. There are many of them traumatized, they are sick. Um, we should be uh, thinking, we, sh we can't expect perfection from people who are shoved together and have opened their doors and are una unable to send people away. I know that they have attracted a few layabouts and bad guys, and um, I'm sorry, of course, I know how difficult it must be to have to live in uh, such a, a small space among people who are really um, both unfriendly and unruly, etc. but there are some people down there. I don't know what will happen. Um, I don't know how things will go on the 26th or 27th when we have the, uh, the next hearing. Um, but um, I think we have to look, instead of worrying and being fearful about the whole situation, on what we can all do. I think one thing we should really work for is establishing a safe injection site. That, for me, could solve a lot of the problems that lead to homelessness. Um, I don't know how it seems to be very difficult to do, and I know um, some, certainly some of the councillors are really pushing this, and I would really push the move towards that. Um, but I think also we should support endeavours like um, the micro-housing um, uh, society is bringing forward, which means the small villages where people apply for membership and have rules. They make up their own rules and they agree with who should be there. So you don't get an influx of people who just want to come in and flop. Okay. Um, they should be small uh, groups. Um, I think it's probably very difficult to have a large city, um, a large camp moving towards micro-housing at once. I know it's been done by some places in the US. Uh, morphing straight from a tent city into a community. But um, if it can be done with micro-housing, where the people who get together and know what they want, know the people they're with, um, and they'll have a say. I believe in housing first, but I also think that no shelter and no home of any description should be set up without some... Um, a, I would say assistance, advice, and consultation with the people themselves who are going to live there. Um, it's no use just popping something down and uh, hoping that um, the, uh, the residents will say, oh, thank you very much, this is wonderful, thank you very much, um, we'll go away. No, these are citizens, they have rights, just as much as the people who are rich and who live in a, maybe Uplands and Oak Bay. So let's all move forward very s slowly, and carefully, and um, stop getting scared. Um, we can do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Kirsten Anderson. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. There could not be a tougher act to follow tonight than Alison Acker. <laughs> Mayor Helps, City Councillors, Thank you for the opportunity to address Council this evening. My spouse and I are new to Victoria and I would like to commend you all for your commitment to being accessible to the citizens you serve. 
It would never have occurred to me to ask to address Winnipeg City Council, and so I'm pleasantly surprised to find that my new city representatives are available to us. I come before you tonight, both reluctantly and sadly, to tell you about the experience we've had with a tent encampment near our home. It's been a fascinating and humbling journey, and I've selected two experiences out of many that I hope illustrate why we can no longer support the presence of this encampment. We moved to Victoria last July and began a routine where we passed through that green space every day on our way to the Y or to the market. In October, we began to notice inconsistencies in the application of the bylaw when campers were permitted to leave their tents up throughout the day. By November, it was clear to us that both the city and the province were not going to act quickly to dismantle the growing camp. My spouse and I are former teachers and former union activists, and we do not scare easily. So we made a conscious and deliberate decision to continue to pass through the park in order to interact with and get to know our new and hopefully temporary neighbours. We developed and maintained friendly relationships with a good many of those original campers and worked hard with them to keep the path through the encampment open. It was not always easy as space became limited and property disputes arose regularly as new campers arrived. And the path became a metaphor for the presence of the tent city in our lives and in our neighbourhood. As long as the path was open, as long as we continued to speak each, to each other respectfully and tried to find middle ground, both figuratively and literally, we thought we could make it work while the various levels of government and advocacy agencies sought more suitable solutions. Beginning in March, we saw a shift in the population and began to see a breakdown in the safe environment that had been created by those campers who established the encampment, many of whom had moved on to transitional or permanent housing options. As well, we began to see the deterioration of quality of life issues, used needles, human and pet feces, disruptive conflicts, open drug use, and fire safety concerns. Our path through the camp grew more and more precarious, culminating in a broken ankle one morning. Certainly no one's fault, but it did cause us to conclude that the path through the camp was no longer safe. Sadly and reluctantly, we began to pass through the Justice Centre parking lot instead. One morning, we were confronted by four tenters sharing a joint and blocking the path to the stairs that, led to, that lead to Courtney Street. In my best non-confrontational good neighbor voice, I respectfully requested that they keep that path and the stairwell clear for people walking through to the Y and accessing the Justice Centre. When I'd made this same request many times up until March, the response was always sincere and accommodating. This time we were greeted with profanity and abuse, and a young woman followed us across Courtney Street. For us, this was a powerful illustration of how tensity was becoming uncontrollable, unpredictable, and an undue hardship for this neighborhood. The metaphor was complete. We went from a path that was hard fought but open, to a path that proved to be risky, to a path that was indeed menacing, unsafe, and effectively impassable. My spouse and I are not mad as hell, but we are many things that could be easily mistaken for mad. We are frustrated at the length of time it's taking to provide suitable housing options that would make it acceptable to close Tent City. We are hugely disappointed in all levels of government, advocacy groups, Christchurch Cathedral and the Tent City leadership for rejecting any effort to establish a liaison group with the owners and residents of the neighbourhood in order to create an avenue where concerns could be dealt with without elevating every issue to that of an emergency by having to call the police. We are dismayed that the rhetoric has become so divisive, polarized, unkind and unhelpful. But mostly we are discouraged that the experience of tent city is killing other projects that might otherwise be acceptable in neighbourhoods. We, we are happy to know some of the people in that camp before it took a turn for the worse. We came to know that the people living on that patch of property are not tragic heroes, but neither are they the dregs of society. We met a number of people who, but for unfortunate circumstances, many of us would be working for them. We're glad to have had this experience, but I'm here to tell you tonight, it's not safe, it's not sustainable. Thank and it must you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please, is Kim Hines. Thank Welcome. you, Mayor, and hey, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Mayor and Council. 
Um, I'm just going to just respond to a few things quickly. They release sex offenders to the communities where there are schools and community centers like Fernwood all the time. They release people from jail for years now right to the streets. They bring them right to Rock Bay where there's families and children. Have been doing that for years. People mean a lot to me. They also have the right to have a lot of land. Um, it would be nice if we actually listened to the people down there. Um, when we first started going down and supporting people at Tent City, there was a lot of support, a lot of good feelings of vibes of love, not very much people, a lot of space, more time and space to hang out. And over time, over capacity, diversity of issues, um, ignorance of some issues, class difference, experience difference, some people criminalized, some people not. We had a lot of different families and situations happen. And it's the, the only 10 city that's ever made it this far, thanks mostly in part to uh, a kind of a, uh, what do you call it, a forward thinking city council who have helped. I mean, Lisa Mayor Helps was there three or four times in the early part and set a tone and people have been waiting to meet with the Liberals for how many months now, and they, they won't meet with them, we know this. Uh, Mount Edwards moving into the community is the one that triggered the, the school. Remember that, it wasn't Tent City that did that. Um, I'm asking the, the city to please support Tent City. I'm really concerned about the level of stigma and hate. I'm at, I was actually worried to come here tonight because yesterday, you all don't know yet, um, but over 20 police, 25 police went through the tent city tent by tent yesterday. I was in a meeting at TAPS and happened to have uh, someone from the tent city come over and ask, ask me to go. And they were just, I mean, I was lucky that we were there to film it. You haven't seen it yet, but you will, trust me. And it upset me, and I'm still in PTSD from it. They had no respect. They just went into every people's tent without warrant. Anyways, some women were sleeping, for example, and woke up when they were inside. It's all on film, and you'll be seeing it in the next few days. So there's a lot of people who have mental health and different things because of the continuing criminalization of poor people and homeless people, right? So if you're homeless, you're going to be followed around like a, a, a criminal. So these are things, and we have, man, we have worse criminals right now working for the government, not your, this one, thank you very much, but a lot of them, and corporations, and oh my lord, talk about problems with criminalizing. Some of the police were happy that the, the tent city was there because people were taking care of each other and they didn't have to follow them around every day. They have to follow around and move the, the homeless every day. They're, 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 they're told to do that. So it's really disgusting and sad. I mean, I'm really upset by the, the social stigma and the hate and the division that it causes. And I'm grateful that there's enough people working with the idea of unity to move forward because there's a lot of diversity at tent city. Different people want different things and that's our community the way it is always. So we need to slow down and listen to them all. There's not just this big bunch. It's, it's just heart-wrenchingly sad that lines can be drawn so easily by hate and stigma that we've been having to deal with horribly. And I hope that since the last city council, people have made complaints. Because you go to that website for police complaints, it, it, it reads like social hate and stigma. I'm really upset because there's, there's a homeless person over there. Like if there's so many people leaving needles and rigs and, and using in the open, where's all the photos? It's, it's unreal. Every, all these people's money have cameras. I want to see the evidence because otherwise it, 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 it screams of, of sad hearts. But anyways, um, I ask people to open their hearts and move forward and stop blaming each other. And I'm really, really grateful for the support. And the eyes of Canada are on Tent City. We have a, a court date coming up. We have people on the ground trying to make art and banners. We got people at Tent City who were in, in council organized to let you know, follow the ordinances that they were working on. And the police usurped that. The police used their power to say like that and just went in and did what they did. It's clear what they were doing. The people there were asked to do it, they were doing it. So there's things that are happening that are really disgusting also in terms of the police state around the poor. And it leaves for a lot of uh, people with post-traumatic stress disorder to get triggered. We have a lot of people on the ground down there doing the best they can to help on all sides and in all the families. And if we can you know, be moved to compassion in our hearts to move forward, we have a court date and we, we, you know, we have work to do as a community to help get people housed in permanent housing because so far the only thing we got is what you folks fought for with CRD, right? CRD housing, 30 million, that's the only thing coming. So that, out of all these months, that's all we got. Anyways, but, so thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Russell Caulfield. Is Russell here? No. So we'll go to Susan Abels then.
Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. I'm here today as a member of um, the Committee to End Homelessness. I'm here to ask Council to allow our soci the society, Microhousing uh, Victoria Society, which we're in the process of considering a name change because it's a bit confusing, to apply for a temporary land use permit to build what is essentially a six bedroom home to house six people in Victoria who are currently living homeless. I put that up. It is true that the concept originated from the idea of microhousing, which is small shacks um, and a village concept, but it evolved based on our consultations with communities, both housed and unhoused, into what is now a modular built six bedroom home. Uh, my colleague uh, Graham uh, Verholst will speak to the design. I'd like to speak to you today about our vision of how and where we fit as a society, what's now called microhousing society, fits within Victoria's landscape of nonprofit housing providers. I was recently invited to attend a focus group to provide input into a process of mapping how people access housing supports in Victoria. There were representatives from the Capital Region Housing Corporation, Kool-Aid, Youth Empowerment Society, Peers that works with uh, sex workers, Burnside Gorge Housing Outreach that works with families and others. And what I came away with from this meeting is that there is no shortage of committed and passionate service providers supporting very vulnerable demo every vulnerable demographic in our society. But their hands are tied. Low barrier housing for youth is almost non-existent. Large families are often broken up because there's no unit large enough to keep them together. This is particularly acute in our immigrant and refugee communities. The assertive community treatment teams, the ACT, the VICOT, the 713 teams, are trying to provide case management for clients who, are, who remain unhoused. If you score below 50 points on the cash application, centralized access to supported housing, you are on the wait list for years. Rent supplements are available, but they're going unused. With vacancy rates at less than 1%, rent supplements are not high enough for people living in poverty to meet the rent, and those who need supplements are competing for rental housing with those who don't need the supplement. When asked what the biggest crisis facing the service providers was, the answer was unanimously housing stock. Housing first is a proven strategy that works, but this strategy, this group declared, has devolved into housing when available. And this is where our vision, or the microhousing society vision, of microhousing fits. The society will work with all agencies to provide housing that is the right fit for their clients. Our vision of microhousing is the six bedroom home. Who lives there and the services provided can be adapted to the needs of the six people living in each home. We must recognize that housing, the housing crisis is so acute that we must look at every opportunity to increase the housing stock. Cook Street is a good example of putting underused land into the provision of supported and affordable housing. We are confident after our meetings with the BC government that funding to build microhouses or these six bedroom homes will be available as sites become available. The cost is the hookup for the utilities only. The land use is temporary so that if the land is needed, for other purposes, the houses can be moved. Please do not let the tensions created by the heightened visibility and awareness of real people living in real poverty at Intent City paralyze productive dialogue about and the development of viable solutions to housing insecurity in the Victoria region. So we ask you to please give us permission to apply for the, for the required permit so that real dialogue with real communities can begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is uh, David Stephenson. Okay. No David, then we'll go to Graham Verhurst. 
And, uh, Mayor, help so I'm going to recuse myself from the chamber. I live uh, about 100 metres from the subject property, and so uh, out of an abundance of ca uh, caution, I'm going to declare a potential pecuniary conflict of interest. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Isaac. And uh, those images can just stay up, actually, if that's okay. Um, so my name is Graham Verhulst, and I'm speaking to 258, or, yeah, 2582 Cook Street in the Microhousing Victoria Society. Um, and I started being involved in this project as a volunteer, and I wanted to offer my professional skills to help. I'm also a principal at Waymark Architecture, and my role changed when our firm was hired to be the architects for this project. We have a housing crisis in our city, and this crisis is disrupting people's lives housed or not. No matter how secure you are in your housing, everyone's quality of life is diminished when residents of our community don't have proper shelter. And it's a proven fact that otherwise unnecessary policing, disruption to, in our parks, uh, the cost of public health care, and a whole list of other things that result from homelessness costs taxpayers more than providing housing to those who don't have it. It makes economic sense. Never mind that in a compassionate, just society, the basic right to shelter is an obligation we have to all citizens. The dedicated group that formed the Microhousing Victoria Society has come up with an innovative, flexible, financially and technically feasible model to provide high quality housing much cheaper than conventional housing and much more quickly. The decision before Council is simply to allow that group of skilled and committed folks to take the next steps. It is not a yes. All it is saying is, sure, keep at it. This ongoing process that did not start with the formation of Microhousing Victoria Society, it actually started right here in City Hall with this very council. It started with the sheltering report. And that report clearly defined the need for an immediate response. That was well over a year ago. Microhousing Victoria Society was created in response to that report, to what was started and agreed to here in this room. And the decision before you is to allow for an application to be crafted and considered. That application will then be further debated once there are details to debate. That application um, is, uh, you know, I'd like to emphasize that you are not being asked to say yes to anything yet. All you are being asked to is for permission to take the next steps. So what are the steps? We've actually, we've already done extensive consultation with potential residents. And that consultation led to the model that we are now proposing, which is very different from what comes to mind when people hear the words microhousing. So uh, the society is considering changing its name. Uh, the extensive consultations have led to a design that is recognizable as housing to everyone. Our designs look and work like a house with six small bedrooms. This gives the amenities and the dignity that residents deserve and deliberately fits into neighborhoods in a distributed and flexible strategy. Different residents can be accommodated in neighborhoods where they would fit in. We took this strategy to the neighborhood associations, nearly every neighborhood association in the city, including the neighborhood association that this site is in. And while we received overwhelmingly positive responses, we were also asked hard questions that helped us to refine the vision. We took this strategy to the media. We've also been active on social media. And through this process, we can say the same thing. We've received overwhelmingly positive responses. And we were also asked hard questions, and that helped us to refine and improve our vision. And this is the project that um, has been through a much more thorough and much more deep community engagement process than any other project, housing or otherwise, that I have ever seen. And we have always planned to consult with the immediate neighbors of any site under consideration. But until now, we haven't been able to take that next step because this is the first site to have been identified by city staff as worthy of serious consideration. It has always been our intent to have discussions with the neighbors before finalizing everything or anything to make sure that their input informs the design that finally gets built. The society has demonstrated at every step in this process that they take engagement seriously. Please allow us to take the next step in that engagement process. And that's all we are asking you right now. We will work with neighbors to address their concerns. Keep in mind that we have a housing crisis. We don't have a parking crisis. And the fact that other sites might be better is irrelevant to whether or not this site is worthy of consideration, especially in the context of, of this crisis. It is incumbent on, looking, or on us to look seriously at every site that could work, even if it's not ideal. Maybe especially if it's not ideal, if we take into account the true scale of the crisis. We don't just have six people in need of housing. We have hundreds. We must look at every site that can be made to work to address this crisis. 
So let us find out if we can find a way to make 2582 Cook Street work. If we can't, so be it, but it behooves us to try. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Bill Stewart. And uh, before you begin, I'll just invite Councillor Isaac back. Thank you. Welcome. Um, um, uh, first, uh, someone's left a recorder here, it looks like. Uh, Did someone leave a recorder? A personal recorder? Oh, or, 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 personal uh, recorder? No. Oh, that, oh sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, okay, uh, evening, Mayor and Council and uh, City staff. Uh, th thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm here um, just to, um, as far as I understand, City staff is still working on the regulations for the for uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, and I just wanted to quickly address uh, one point that had been brought up. Uh, you had mentioned uh, prohibiting safe in or prohibiting on-site inhalation and but allowing for variances. And uh, I think that's a, a, a very reasonable compromise. Um, I, I know it's probably not a favorable opinion amongst, uh, amongst dispensary staff and owners, but I, I think it's, it's reasonable that the city would want to uh, maintain some kind of control on that. But, to, but I think if you, if you just simply prohibit it and don't allow for variances, you will cause hardship to people. Um, I just found out today actually about uh, a woman who was living in a park in the city, not down at Tent City, but uh, out in a park with her with her child who lost, who just lost her home because she uh, she uses medical marijuana, and her landlord found out and kicked her out. And given the the, the homeless, or g given the the housing, uh, the, the lack of affordable housing, I'm very concerned for her her uh, situation in particular. Um, I also um, I just. Uh, uh, and that was basically what I wanted to say in, in regards to uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, I also did want to address, because this, this is clearly a meeting uh, centered around homelessness, uh, I myself first arrived in the city homeless um, probably back uh, back in the 90s, back when uh, Bob Cross was mayor, and the city had a very uh, different uh, approach and response to homelessness, and, and I'm very glad to see that we're, that, uh, that we, we have a council and a mayor now who are, who are uh, who are much more uh, taking a much more engaged and uh, active approach to it. Uh, in the years that I've lived here, and um, I was on the street for a number of years. I've been off the street now for about four years. Um, the, it's clear to me that you have about two tides a year coming in from across, from across the country, and I think part of it that should really be dealt with federally and provincially should be should be addressed in that. And I don't know what kind of nightmare that uh, presents you with, or, or I don't really have a, a, a model to. Uh, to, to suggest, but it, but I think it is, I think it does, there is clearly, um, I, I came from Ontario personally, and in Ontario we get a lot of people out from the East Coast, and there's clearly a, 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 this, this sort of westward migration throughout Canada, and it should be addressed, I think, on, on, on a federal level, and, and again, the province should, should be involved with it well too, but uh, as well. But again, thank you so much for, for, the, for being, taking such a proactive uh, stance towards the problem. I know you've, take, you've certainly taken a lot of heat for it, and there's a lot, it's a contentious issue, but you've, you've certainly at least tried to deal with it, as opposed to just sweep it under the rug, and, and I think you should be commended for that. And, uh, and again, thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Donald Smith. Okay, uh, Nathan Moss has indicated to us that he will not be here this evening. Uh, so the next speaker then is Jim Jorgen. Jim. Uh, next then is Douglas Curran. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Douglas Curran. I live at 1161 Burdett. I'll leave a copy of this for you tomorrow. I want to speak about a situation with respect to representation and community associations. On February 2nd of this year, an information meeting to review a proposed 36-unit condo building for Burdett Avenue was conducted by the Land Use Committee of the Fairfield Gonzales Community Association. Subsequently, on February 15th, a report on this proposed development and the meeting was submitted to the council and mayor here by Calic. I want to express my thoughts in my report on the public process to date surrounding this proposal, as well as the manner in which it was handled by Calic. In my past six years, I worked extensively with developers, 
DNV Council, District of North Vancouver, community groups and NGO service organizations, community building. My experiences here, as well as the report submitted to Council, fails to meet the mark for adequate, thorough, or appropriate public process. It's difficult to accept the report submitted by CALIC, filled as it is with inaccuracies, errors, and subjective editorializations. It does not accurately convey the thinking or input of the neighborhood most directly impact by this proposal. The manner in which the meeting itself was conducted leaves a great deal to be desired with the chair of the meeting attempting to tightly corral and restrict any comments to a predetermined narrow focus of questions. Two, while dealing with the complexity of a comprehensive development project, the matter was given the smallest time slot of the evening, leaving little opportunity for many from the community to speak. In many instances, remarks from across the neighborhood were wrongly ascribed to only one building on Rockland Avenue. This was explained in the report submitted to you as, quote, most questions came from different people, but these are apartments, so they have the same address. That's not true at all. Other contradictions or unsupportable items appeared throughout the report. The proposal is described in the report as, quote, has generous landscaping, which stands in opposition to questions from the local residents questioning why the plan called for variances for reduced setbacks, which is directly contradicting of the meaning of generous. Several people have expressed to me that the meeting left them feeling railroaded or handed a fait accompli. Subsequently, the chair advised me that he was working under a degree of duress and confinement, citing, quote, it seems the more you get involved in bureaucracy, the less of a voice you actually have. Your approach, with right fit for Burdett, does not have restrictions, therefore is likely to be a more effective way to communicate your concerns. It is difficult to contemplate those remarks as being other than an abdication of responsibility and the obligation to the residents of my neighborhood and community. Through these statements and other emerging patterns, it's apparent to myself and others that CALIC and the Fairfield Gonzalez Community Association is compromised in its operations. It lacks the ability to extricate itself from a bind largely of its own design and does not authentic, authentically speak or represent the community whose name it marches under. It lacks the appetite and urge to develop authentic engagement or accountability to the residents. This report is deeply flawed in its summaries, its execution, and has no place as part of a credible public process. It does not speak for or reflect the thinking of my neighborhood and should not be offered offering its comments in the manner it has to the City of Victoria and its elected officials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please, is Sue McKenzie. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I live on the corner of Quadra and Burdette. I've already sent all of you letters about the scary things I've seen and heard in my neighborhood. I'm woken up at night, I keep my dra drapes closed, and don't go out on foot after dark. My blood pressure has gone from 115, 115, over 60, to 150, 150, over 90. When I see people fighting and hear them cursing, I get flashbacks to my marriage to a violent, alcoholic. I never look at Tent City and think us and them. I'm really concerned that Tent City is becoming normalized. I question the assumption that Tent City is better than living on the streets. And I think I've had some backup from previous speakers there. I know Tent City is much worse than permanent social housing and assisted living with help for mental health issues and addictions. Also, not 
Also, only permanent housing will convince the judge to allow Tent City to be disbanded. It's a wonderful measure for protest and a bad solution for everything else, in my opinion. My understanding is that the city and the province have each set aside $30 million for housing. The housing should be ready in five years. Unfortunately, we don't have five years. We have only until June 27th to convince the judge that there are permanent spaces for the campers to move to. The longer we delay, the worse the situation will become. These campers have needed help for a long time. Some might say decades. And we need to be prepared for future campers too. My impression from the Monday Forum on May 30th was that the city has looked to the provincial government, our place, and faith communities to provide spaces. Despite the fact that the campers are on provincial land, the city still has to own some responsibility for helping to solve the problems around Tent City. We're talking people here, not just land. Residents of Victoria are suffering both inside and around the camp. My suggestion is this. Start something, anything, quickly, to demonstrate your resolve to provide permanent housing. Councillor Izzet sent me a letter re-sheltering area on Victoria, House, uh, Victoria Courthouse grounds. So I imagine sheltering area is a phrase that means tent city. He says, my position is that the city should work proactively with the province to acquire an alternate site for a properly managed sheltering area, sheltering area, as an interim measure, uh, preferably on vacant industrial or commercial land. I'm delighted that such sites exist but I would hope they could be made available for permanent housing. Um, otherwise, it's just shuffling campers around in a way that the judge has already said is unacceptable. And I hope the land wouldn't be contaminated as industrial sites sometimes are. The judge is expecting quality as well as quantity in the housing offered. I don't want to minimize the difficulties here. Tent City neighbors had a meeting cancelled because of threats to the venue, and I wasn't allowed to send a letter to the judge. You guys have a lot of things going for you. You have a safe place to talk. You have powers as mayor and council. You have useful energy. You, can, you have vacant buildings and lots you could use. You have between 30 and $90 million. Please do something right now, or Tent City could be with us for a long time. We all want safe housing. We're all on the same side. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker, please, is Jordan Reichert. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, clearly, uh, homelessness is a crisis in our city right now, as uh, many of the speakers tonight uh, have spoken about. Uh, for a multitude of reasons, people are not able to acquire housing that meets their needs, and the prospect of finding affordable housing is even more dire right now. <clears throat> From the most recent data I could find, Tennessee rates in Victoria sit at just below 1%. While the price of renting and buying a home in Victoria continue, continues to rise to unprecedented levels. However, there is another issue that affects a diverse cross section of people looking for housing the ability to bring their family members with them who happen to be pets. Currently, 20% of animals surrendered to the BCSPCA are due to housing related reasons. So that's roughly an estimated 1,500 animals surrendered because people could not take their pets with them. Uh, when transitioning to a new home. Research indicates that approximately 80% of BC citizens support legislation that would allow animal caretakers to have the right to keep their pets in their home, 
Uh, there's also evidence that tenants who have pets in pet-friendly housing stay for more than double the length of time than in housing which does not allow pets. Also, the idea that pets are more likely to damage rental units uh, also appears to be unfounded as there is no evidence to support that more damage is caused by renters with pets than without. Ontario has legislation in place uh, for the last 20 years that prohibits landlords from discriminating against renters based on them having pets. There are reasonable exceptions to this, of course, if there's a concern of severe allergy, if there's a safety concern related to the animal in question, and if the animal is causing excessive noise or damage to the unit. Pets OK BC is an organization I am working with uh, to try and change the current discriminatory legislation that puts unnecessary barriers in place to stop people from getting affordable housing because they have cherished pets. It doesn't matter if you are someone who's experiencing homelessness, a student or a professional. If you have to leave a loved one behind because they are a non-human animal, it affects you deeply and many people will, will understandably forego improving their housing situation because they, have not, they, because they will not leave their pet behind. It is also unfair to the animal in question. Imagine having a good home, a loving home, knowing the people you wake up with every day and trust to treat you with respect, love, and kindness are there and treat you like family, then one day you become a barrier to housing for unfounded reasons and are suddenly disposable. Waking up not with those you loved and trusted, but in a cage with so many others who have no place to call home. Non-human animals are already the most vulnerable individuals in our society, but they are also some of the best individuals in it as well. Enhancing the ability for people to not have to compromise their relationships of care for these individuals is essential if we are to call ourselves a compassionate society. And this is surely a small step in a long road of changes we need. That is why I'm calling you, Victoria, Mayor and Council, to take what action you can on this issue. Uh, recognizing, of course, that while it may be out of your power to change this legislation directly, uh, you can advocate on behalf of the many citizens and pets affected by this discrimination. If you would write a letter of support for such changes to the current Residential Tenancy Act to our Minister of Housing and Social Development, Rich Coleman, uh, you could be the first city to do so in BC and would help inspire other cities to take up the same effort to keep families together with their loved ones, whether they're animal or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Christopher Schmidt. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Helps and City Councillors. I live in the area near Mount Edwards Court, and for the last three months, I have documented the dialogue at meetings hosted by the Victoria Kool Aid Society. From recordings, I made transcripts, and from these transcripts, I developed amendments to record the real dialogue that Kool Aid failed to include in its minutes. To put it mildly, it was a most difficult task getting Kool Aid to incorporate my items into their minutes. As well, prior to this year, I was a director on the board and executive committee of the Fairfield Gonzales Community Association. The neighborhood has roundly rejected Kool-Aid's presence at Mount Edwards. Kool-Aid started meetings to obtain a liaison group with the neighborhood, but instead those meetings turned into a venue where neighbors attended to send the clear message that Kool-Aid is not welcome now nor in the future. My own attendance at meetings is the result of having been put in an untenable situation where I must attend for the sake of the neighbourhood to speak to BC Housing and to police and to the city and to ensure that the real dialogue be minuted. It has taken a lot of time to do so. Kool-Aid claims on its website that neighbourhood representatives helped write a framework draft. That is absurd since in the real world those few individuals do not represent anyone else in the neighbourhood. They are mostly silent at meetings compared to the uproar coming from the vast majority of attendees. As of now, Kool-Aid has stopped hosting meetings since Kool-Aid's intent was that those meetings be a venue about current operations at Mount Edwards, yet neighbors have used those meetings to discuss its future, specifically a future that does not involve Kool-Aid. Its ending meetings is a tacit acknowledgement that Kool-Aid has failed to obtain the communications framework that it needs with the neighborhood, so keep this in mind. As of now, neighbors, parents, and representatives of the cathedral are organizing to hold meetings without Kool-Aid with the clear agenda of how to ensure Kool-Aid's departure from the neighborhood. 
There is another issue that is concerning and directly relevant to the process of consulting the community, and that is the funding relationship between city and provincial governments and the Cala Coast for Fairfield. Unlike most neighbourhoods, this Calic does not exist independent of funding concerns and the staff of that association are more interested in maintaining their relationships with their funders than they are with conveying community concerns and this has been manifestly evident at Kool-Aid meetings and it is a betrayal. The FGCA has since stated that it does not represent the neighbourhood so there should be no confusion among members of City Council that an FGCA position is not the neighbourhood's position. So also keep that in mind. The neighbourhood has been loud and clear about its rejection of Kool-Aid and low barrier housing. On this basis, any effort to rezone Mount Edwards to permit continued Kool-Aid op Kool operation would be an absurd waste of resources. However, if it were to occur, it would require a Calic that operates independent of other concerns. I would like to share with you our personal experiences. On the afternoon that the neighbourhood meeting started, a man overdosed outside my, my, my window. My wife has been repeatedly harassed on her way home from work. She has witnessed a man punched in the face by a homeless person. Uh, she has witnessed a couple shooting up on the street and needles on the sidewalk. I have been accosted without provocation. I have witnessed drug deals on the street and my photo was taken by a homeless man as I came out of a neighborhood meeting. Those are the behaviors of addiction and mental illness and criminality. Moving them to Mount Edwards will entrench them further. They need more than a roof over their heads, but more importantly, the neighbourhood needs a better solution that protects it, since once outside the facility, behaviour cannot be controlled. Children still attend school across the street, and one might safely assume that those children are being put at risk, and it is an outrage that certain members of government favour an agenda over those children's well-being. This was a quiet neighbourhood where frail seniors could walk the block in safety, but this Mayor and this Council have allowed events to take place that have changed it drastically just to achieve an agenda. It is clear that interests are being padded to push something upon us, so I would like two related things from Council. I would like the Council to support an independent Calic that might stand a chance of conveying community concerns to the City, which could be seen as part of my second request, which is that I would like Council to make every effort to ensure the end of contract departure of that most inappropriate operation from that most inappropriate location. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on these matters. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Bernice Camano. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, first of all, I, like, I need to acknowledge that we are on the territory of the Coast Salish people, home to the Lekwungen and the Esquimalt nations. I'm here this evening, of course, to talk about Tent City. On the night of February the 10th, 2016, there were at least 1,387 people experiencing homelessness in Victoria. We cannot be, forget that behind each number is an indigi individual with their own personal stories, meaning there were 1,387 individuals with 1,387 stories who on the night of February the 10th did not have a safe place they could call home. They shared their stories time and time graciously and patiently in the hope and belief that this information will lead to change. I am an Aboriginal outreach worker for the Coalition to End Homelessness. I deal with people every day that are broken, who have survived residential school, foster care. I have, I deal with these people on a daily basis. I am a survivor as well. So when they speak to me, it goes to the depth of who I am and I understand their pain. I think what is uh, bothering me more than anything about the whole issue around homelessness, Tent City, Mount Edwards, all of it, is that we are losing perspective here. I think that um, while I appreciate the people that are housed and, and live in their neighborhood, what I really would like to see is an opportunity for people to come together. You know, it doesn't have to be huge. Let's start slowly and let's start um, talking. You know, um, uh, hating, 
hating people in tent city, tent people hating people that live in, in the community. It has to stop. We're not going to get anywhere if we carry on like this. We're not going to get anywhere. And I think this is a really good opportunity for the community to come together and let's start breaking down these barriers because if we don't break them down, there is going to be no change. As far as the province supplying um, monies to house um, the homeless community, people in tent cities, shelters are not the answer. I'm, I would uh, like to invite um, council people in the community who think that this would be a good option. It's the only option we have right now to spend a week in a shelter and, and uh, feel how it, it feels like to be treated like um, a person in the community that has no um, uh, presence. They're just somebody that keeps getting put from one shelter to another. As I did suggest, and as a few of the uh, community members have mentioned, I do believe that the opportunity is now for us to come together. And, and I, I miss the forum that uh, was held. Um, I was out of town, and I was quite disappointed I wasn't here, because I would like to have been a uh, participant in that. But I think we really have to come together as a community and start talking about how to make changes and just stop hating each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is Tammy Doyle. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Bear with me, my jitters are probably really high. <laughs> my name is Tammy Doyle, and I work with mental health and addictions. I've worked with it for over 20 years, and I have seen so much, some good, some bad. I say that mental health has made great strides, where addictions has not. Um, addictions has unfortunately been blanketed, umbrella, however you want to say it, in with mental health. And I feel that that was a big mistake. Um, I know that um, each province has undergone to incorporate addictions in with mental health but the reality is, is that addictions has its own face. While some of the traits are with mental health, a lot of the addictions holds its own face and has its own identity. Homelessness is a problem, yes, but the root of it is what has to be acknowledged. And I'm not sure if homing is first on the list that needs to be acknowledged. I think that what's causing a person to want to live on the street needs to be acknowledged first, what's caused them that. There's pain, there's suffering, there's the no will to live. There's the no will to want anything in their life. I've read the reports on the Facebook or wherever it comes from. They're not striving for anything in their life anymore. They get it for free. We're giving them homes. They destroy them. There are lots of places where they could live, but the truth is, is that these people have these problems, illnesses, whatever we call them, and they can't live in these homes. The stigmas around mental health are real. Addictions don't have the same stigmas that mental health does, but yet we blanket addictions into mental health. The truth is, is that an addiction person an addicted person will not seek help because it's under the mental health umbrella. And that is the truth. They would rather stay in their addictions than go seek help through mental health. That is because of the stigmas. So if we could separate addictions like we do medical health, some of these people that have addictions could suffer with chronic pain. But because they have the addiction and it's under the mental health umbrella, they have no choice but to go through mental health. There are actual people who were addicted, went in for treatment through mental health, are fine. They have no illnesses for mental illness and cannot get out of the umbrella for mental illness. They are trapped there because it's a mental illness that is now recognized, but they don't have the illness. They had the addiction. 
So there is the separation, but we have to give it that. I don't have much more to say other than that. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, is uh, Christian Barnard. Okay. Uh, then we'll go to the final speaker of the evening, uh, Donna Umbras. First of all, starting with protocol, I am honored to be in the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt people's traditional territory. Um, I just wanted to speak to uh, some of the some of the things that have been said. You know, like the fear and that. Well, truth be known, living inside Tent City for three months, I was afraid by the neighbors myself. Uh, we had one woman that was screamed and yelled at from a balcony woman and was called a squaw. Uh, we had bear canisters popping off in the middle of the night in different areas of Tent City, which was very alarming. And... Uh, if you could, Don, if you could just direct your comments up here, that would be wonderful. Okay, Thank and you. and so and we also had an individual that um, became our four o'clock um, alarm clock every morning. He must have been a shift worker or something. It guaranteed four a.m. He'd honk on his horn from one end of the street to the next end. This is stuff that we faced inside Tent City. Uh, and yes, there, there, there is a drug problem. It's a problem in all cities, all communities. It's, it's a big problem. And uh, within Tent City, um, recognizing that as a problem, three quarters of the people in Tent City took fentanyl training. And it's through the, that training that um, we managed to bring back uh, a lot of overdose people. And the people that we did bring back, if they had overdosed in a doorway of a, of a side street, they would certainly have died. And that's reality. Uh, in Tent City, the oldest member we had was 80 years old. He was a man that lived in um, Port Alberni, and on release from the hospital, they brought him to the bus station, gave him a ticket, and they sent him here. And uh, the only reason why he found his way to Tent City, he was lost. And an individual on the bus recognized that and talked to him. And so they re redirected him to Tent City. We also have a student who is uh, of age, trying to complete her grade 12. And she was living at Tent City because she had no place to live. And uh, when we talk about... Um, the places that are available, that were made available, that there isn't a one set answer for every person that is homeless. Uh, the people that are homeless in Tent City, most of them fall right through the cracks. They don't fit anywhere. They don't even fit at our place. Uh, these are the first people that usually get sent packing. These are the people that have mental disabilities that can't control what they're saying or their actions or what they're doing. So they just get brushed off. And uh, the truth is that with the homeless people that are in Tent City, I consider them refugees. Uh, you close Tent City, you send them back into the city, then they're at risk of being harmed uh, is greater than in Tent City. One of the things like in Tent City that um, one of the main things that, that really, really gave me a lot of uh, confidence and knowing that we were doing the right thing was waking up one morning and hearing women belly laughing from a tent. Now really, really think of that. Uh, when was the last time do you think they were able to do that, being homeless inside the city? I would think never. Uh, we've had uh, mothers come down and hug us and being so thankful because at least they knew where their child was now. They didn't have to search the streets looking for their loved ones. Um, 
And, and really the truth is, I mean, if everybody could acknowledge this here, most people are one paycheck away from being homeless themselves. And that's reality. These people that are in Tent City, yes, the, the atmosphere has changed um, a lot. Uh, and, uh, it, but the dream hasn't, you know. Um, when you talk about uh, setting up shelters, no one wants shelters. They either want homes or a place to call their own. Um, one of the things that I think would, you know, work as well as, you know, micro housing and all those other things coming together. But I do think there should be a Thank plot you. of land somewhere Thank you very where much. they can a plot of land somewhere where they can pitch their tent and Thank live. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of this uh, section. I know there aren't many members of the public left, but for those of you here and those of you watching online and for those of you who will one day watch the archive, I just want to, on behalf of Mayor and Council, thank everybody here for a very respectful conversation this evening. I really appreciate that. Okay, with that, we move on to Section G, uh, Unfinished Business. We have one item. It's a letter from Minister Stilwell to be received for information. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. We move on now to the Committee of the Whole report from the meeting of June 2nd. Uh, and we have a number of items here. I will ask Mr. Coates to go through them uh, one at a time. And I'll note that when we get to item number two, uh, Councillor Thornton Joe has a creative uh, workaround for an issue that came up earlier today. Mr. Coates, number one, please. It's for Council to receive the report on the downtown late night program and uh, direct the reconvening of the original task force to receive their input. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Alto. Yeah, it's time for us to do stuff now. Okay, thank you. Discussion? Councillor Isaac? So I was uh, in Winnipeg for the FCM conference this day, but what was the rationale between reconvening the original task force rather than striking a fresh task force? Uh, there were members of the original task force who asked uh, to be able to give their input these many years later to see how things are going. So it's kind of a one-time check-in. There is an operational um, group that meets and, and regularly reviews outcomes and, and you know, adjusts accordingly. But the, the original task force, some members wanted to, to meet and just be uh, checked in with about how it had gone. Would we want to renew it by appointing some additional members? It's meant, I think, just my remembering from the conversation, it's meant to be kind of a one-time convening. Uh, Director Hamilton, can you comment? Yes, through Mayor Helps. Uh, we discussed last week the opportunity to reconvene the uh, previous uh, representatives from the various groups, have a touch base and report back to Council on what we heard at that and assess at that time whether it would be worth reconvening or reinventing another task force going forward. Were the Downtown Residents Association, were they represented on the original task force? Yes. Yeah. Councillor Thornton Joe? Uh, at the time we reached out to many groups like uh, the colleges, the Residents Association, the Business Association, the Taxis uh, Association. Uh, mums like the ones that Drive you home. Um, I forget the the term. The the ones that, the company that we had those, um, we had the liquor control board. So there are many groups that came and uh, the youth council. So would this have those legacy members, or for example, would the DRA be asked to send a delegate to this meeting, or would someone who was there a decade ago who might not even live in Victoria anymore? come to this meeting. Uh, Director Hamilton? Uh, through Mayor Helps. Uh, in fact, many of the task force members are no longer in Victoria, uh, nor in the same positions they were at the time. Uh, we will look at the representation from the, the working group and, and request that a representative be um, provided from each agency. Perfect. Anything? Yeah, particularly the, the downtown residents are a core group. I think an, a current member of their board or the board's designate should be there. Excellent. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, item number two, please, Mr. Coates. And that's to uh, receive the report on the uh, first quarter, uh, the first quarter report on 2016 operational work plan and thanks staff for the great work. <laughs> Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Uh, Councillor Thornton-Joe. Uh, uh, 
Thank you, Mayor Helps. Uh, just a process question. Uh, this morning I brought forward a, a motion regarding uh, dogs on Gonzales Beach. And the discussion this morning was that uh, we had already concluded our uh, quarterly operational discussions last week. And so my understanding is it's, it's not uh, concluded until it is approved tonight at council meeting. So with that in mind, I am hoping that I can uh, put the motion onto the table uh, right now before we finalize the operational work plan for this quarter. Okay, so then we're, Mr. Coates, is it possible to bring up the motion sheet from earlier in the day so we can see Councillor Thornton Joe's motion? Uh, we can down tools for a couple of minutes and do that for sure. Sure, why don't we take a short break? We'll do that. And Councillor Thornton Joe, it will be an amendment that we receive the report for information. Thanks, staff, for great work and uh, direct staff to report back on, et cetera. Okay, so I, I, I'll reconvene the meeting and just be really clear. I know this is a, a new process and every time we come up with it, it, it comes up, it feels clunky, but I think that's just because it's new. So what we're going to, the amendment is not that staff go and do this work, but that the staff report back to council on the implications to the strategic plan and operational plan of doing this work. And that that happened within, I think it's two GPC, or committee of the whole meetings. Please place your amendment on the table. So, thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you. The motions are on the table, so I would like to amend it that staff report back within two committee of the whole meetings <laughs> uh, on the uh, on the impl motion and the implications uh, of adding this. of adding this to the to the, to the work plan or strategic plan. Perfect. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Madoff. Discussion on that amendment. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Councillors Lucas, Isaac, and Alto. Councillor Lucas and then Councillor Isaac. Okay. Thank you. Um, I thought we had talked earlier that we were going to put this into the Parks Master Plan because, as I said earlier today, um, when this was seen on the um, committee report, the James Bay Neighborhood Association, there were a number of people who spoke to, they would like to see this in their uh, neighborhood. So it seems a little unfair that Gonzales uh, Beach is gonna come before the rest. Like it seems to me it should all be done um, together on the Parks Master Plan. So the clarification from staff earlier is that beaches are not in the Parks Master Plan okay. and parks are. So beaches are not being considered as part of the Parks Master Plan okay. at Thank all. You. Yes, uh, Councillor Isaac. Is that really the case? So I don't know if staff exactly said. I think the, the bylaw provision is in the animal control bylaw, but presumably Gonzales Beach Park, along with all the other um, parks that have foreshore, are a part of that planning process. Is that the case? Yes, and presumably Cam access to off-leash and on-leash and other areas within the Gonzales neighborhood would be examined in the context of the master plan process. Through Mayor Helps, it is a parks and open spaces master plan, so there may be um, some items that we look at that are outside city-owned lands. Okay. Mr. Johnson? I, I think, sorry, before Mr. Johnson speaks, I think what we all want to know is, will this work be done anyway? Or if we don't ask staff to look at the implications of doing this work, will status quo remain on Gonzales Beach forever? This will be included as part of the parks master plan. And uh, for council members, and I know I don't look at it all that often, but if we look at our sheets that are in front of us with city properties, you can see how that's denoted as park, and that would be included as part of that review. So a consider, sorry, okay, so that's different information than we received earlier today. So consideration of dogs on beach in, on Gonzales Park will be considered as part of the parks master plan? That's my understanding. We're early enough in the process that we can include that as part of it. Okay. Thank you very much. So with that knowledge, I'll leave councillors uh, to decide whether to vote in favour or against this amendment. Does anyone else wish to speak on it? Yes, Councillor Isaac. Without getting too much into the weeds of the issue, but like I've now read the animal control bylaw provision, looked at the map. This is 
probably, this is the most popular swimming beach in the city. And I'm just trying to reconcile how compatible dog excrement with children and families so swimming. Councilor Isaac, Councilor Isaac, we're not debating that. All we're debating is well, but, I, but that for me is, is it even worth staff doing this preliminary report when I'm just trying to think, hopefully dog owners clean up after their dogs. It's a fact that some don't. I'm trying to weigh the public health concerns and certainly human excrement is disposed of about two and a half kilometers from this point, but it's the end of a deep ocean outfall. And that is different than the, that excrement being disposed of right on the beach and washing up on shore. And in some tidal conditions, it would be fine, but the tide shifts by about an hour every day. And so I think more of an analysis is needed. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thornton Joe, do you wish to speak? And then I'd like to speak. And then if it's okay, I'd like uh, thank to Thank you, Mayor Helps. And, and that analysis uh, will be done if the staff um, come back and say that it will be looked at. And that analysis will be done as well as input from the community, whether they do in fact support it and don't support it. Uh, one thing about the Gonzales Beach, and, and, I, and I'm trying to um, reflect the history because Councillor Madoff and Councillor Coleman and I were in the original Dogs and Parks Committee, which I don't envy anyone going on that committee because that issue of dogs and off-leash parks is very... Uh, heated issue in the community. Um, but if, if Councillor Madoff can remember, I almost think that uh, Gonzales Beach was taken, there was the parks and we had discussed all the parks and then we had brought in the discussion of Gonzales Beach uh, almost as a, as, a, as a separate piece at the time. It wasn't discussed in, in the same way as we talked about the parks. And so um, I can understand that in the master plan when we discussed the parks, we should we can review the off leash areas and the times because uh, some of the activities that were are being were considered in 2004 may have changed by now. Um, but regarding this one, my understanding is there's a, uh, a a weird legal aspect in that dogs can be on one part of the beach and as long as the owner carried the dog past the city portion, they could probably be on the beach, which doesn't make sense if we can look at um, the hours, which the community, some of the members of the community are just asking for early morning before children come down and uh, later in the evening. And one of the neighbors said that since the, there is no dogs on parks right now, uh, the geese are starting to come and the, the geese droppings are more of an issue right now. But I, I hope that, I was, what I'm hoping is that we can at least get staff to, to come back and say whether the work is too big for them to do at this time, whether a pilot program may be considered for a month or, or whatever they, they come back and, and let us know. And that's the only opportunity uh, or request that I'm making at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate Councillor Thornton Joe bringing this back up tonight because it does give us, uh, it did give us an uh, opportunity to get clarity from staff. Um, and we're, I feel that we're assured that the question of dogs in parks, on beaches, in open spaces, et cetera, will be considered as part of the parks master planning process. So I'm not going to support this amendment tonight um, because then it does put one neighborhood in front of the other. I know there's a propensity when things come forward from members of the public to do everything right now all at once, and it feels satisfying when we can do that, but I think we need to take uh, a comprehensive approach. Uh, and um, if this wasn't coming forward as part of the parks master plan, I would certainly support the motion to get the work done. Um, the Parks Master Plan, as Councillor Isaac said, uh, and as our staff have indicated, will be coming to us in draft form by the end of December. Uh, that's a lot of time to get a pilot project or indeed restrictions removed on Gonzales Beach for next year if that's the direction that uh, the Parks Master Plan and the public uh, as part of the consultation process would like to go. So for that reason, I'm not going to support the amendment. It doesn't mean I don't support exploring this. It just means I think we should do it as part of a bigger picture. Councillor Loveday. Yeah, um, could we scroll up to the top? I'm just wanting to get clarity on the, on the actual motion. Is it, the wording here says report back on the following motion and the implications? I'm, I'm it should just be on the implications. Of the yeah, following. There was writing and typing okay. happening at the same just, time. Just making sure, because yes. they're two different things. They so, certainly are. I, I, I'm fine with getting the resource implications of doing this. I, I think that if, if we're telling staff to, uh, in two weeks or whenever, or a month when it comes back, um, if, if it requires engagement with the neighborhood and, and whatnot to launch a pilot project, that could be a, more intensive than we than 
could be anticipated. If it was just to launch a pilot project, that would just be don't send bylaw officers there in the morning, and that would be easier to, to do. So I'm, I'm fine with getting the information on, on the resource implications, but I'm not sure that I'll support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, on that, I'm going to call the question on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? One, two, three, four. Sorry, one, two, three. All those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. So the motion, the amendment fails. Uh, now back to the main motion to receive this report for information and thank staff for their great work. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, and Councillor Thornton Joe, thank you again for bringing that forward. You tried, yeah, and, and we'll proceed as we've decided. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Mr. Coates, number three, please. That's the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project uh, that the Mayor right on behalf of Council to the Prime Minister reiterating the City's opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project. So moved. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Loveday, seconded by Councillor Isaac. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favour? Any opposed? One opposed. Thank you. Next. And that's the uh, Council motion on transgender human rights protection. So moved. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Loveday, seconded by Councillor Alto. Any discussion? I just actually wanted to take the time to thank the councillors for um, committing to doing this work. Uh, as you know, I was confused at the last meeting. I thought you were asking staff to do stuff, but uh, it's commendable that you're going to take this on and bring us something back. Okay, uh, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our May 2nd, sorry, June 2nd meeting and on to the meeting of June the 9th which is our meeting of earlier today. Uh, number one, please, Mr. Coates. And I think one and two are fine to do together because they relate to the same property. Unless I'm wrong. Oh, that's, sorry, no, go ahead. It doesn't relate to any property at all. <laughs> My confusion. Um, so this is the uh, instructing staff to prepare the proposed zoning regulation amendment bylaws for the uh, minor amendments. Process. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Madoff. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Loveday. Yes, Councillor Loveday, question. Question to staff. Are, is, are there any uh, applications that staff are aware of, um, any proposals either in the hopper or that have had communications with city staff that any of these changes would affect? Uh, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Isaac. Is it possible when this comes forward to get a, a version showing what text is being struck out and what text is being added? Because in the past, there has been some discussion and input from the public over whether or not changes are, are truly minor in nature. And to get that kind of a version, would that require an additional direction? Or? Um, Mr. Uh, Tinney or Mr. Coates? Mr. Tinney, we'll start with you. Your microphone's on. Uh, sure, I was just sort of looking for that uh, when, when we bring this back for, uh, for subsequent readings. Yeah, so what, not to hold it up at this stage, but when it comes, it would essentially be a bit different than what we usually get at first reading, but it would essentially have a background document that would just have essentially the draft showing cha track changes, so striking out text and the addition of new text, so we have a apples and apples comparison. Uh, we can look into that or, or simply provide the, the previous text along sure. with the changes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Coates, did you want to add something? Certainly, just to clarify that we can definitely bring a document forward that it makes it uh, extremely clear what the changes are, what's being struck out. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. And next is the uh, tax exemption Bylaw for uh, 533, 537 Fisk Garden, 534 Pandora. Okay, moved by Councillor Thornton Joe, seconded by Councillor Madoff. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, it's, it was three and four that I was thinking of, Mr. Coates, that we can read together or move together. And that's the uh, rezoning application for uh, preparing the zoning amendment bylaws for 155 Linden Avenue, as well as the uh, Proceeding with uh, notice on the accompanying development permit. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Madoff. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Loveday. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? 
Any opposed? Thank you. Next is uh, moving forward with uh, consideration of readings for the um, OCP and uh, zoning amendments required for speed in Francis Avenue. Thank you, Council. Can we have someone move these uh, this motion? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Young. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Loveday. Uh, discussion. Okay. All those in favor. Those opposed? One is opposed. The motion passes. Uh, next. It's authorizing issuance of the heritage alteration permit for 537 Johnson Street. Okay, moved by Councillor Loveday. Is there a seconded by Councillor Alto? Any discussion? Uh, yes, Councillor Thornton Joe, then Councillor Young. Uh, th thank you. I, I did want to acknowledge a, a letter we received from uh, some of the residents, but um, one of the comments I want to make is uh, so much of the emphasis in the letter is regarding the uh, heritage issues and um, re going back to the report that from this morning, I understand that it went to the Heritage Advisory Panel and it was reviewed by the panel and was recommended for approval. Uh, so where that issue is concerned, I, I feel that it has been approved by the Heritage Advisory. And then the other piece that I had uh, was concerned about were were fumes and um, uh, the, the cooking, and uh, we received, uh, I think, an email from staff this morning or this afternoon regarding that. And uh, I think uh, it's been addressed. And at this point, I'm comfortable with that, unless I hear something else from my colleagues that would make me think differently. Thank you, Councillor Thornton, Joe, Councillor Young. Uh, well, I, I, obviously, we all looked at the letter from the neighbors, which uh, perhaps. Um, is new information since we um, considered this this morning. I, 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 I have a little bit of uneasiness about this um, in the sense that um, it, it's uh, the, the um, provision is for two years. Uh, I guess my question would be, um, and perhaps I don't know if the staff can answer this, why do we use that period of time? It's, it seemed to me that assuming the purpose of the temporary provision is to recognize a situation that has arisen um, uh, unexpectedly, if you like, uh, that this is, a, this is something that is intended to, to fill a gap that's arisen, uh, is it really necessary to have a two-year uh, permit rather than, say, 18 months or a year, which might seem a more reasonable length of time for an applicant to uh, make plans, uh, decide what, um, uh, how, how they wanted to address their needs in a more permanent uh, way, and uh, then put that um, in, in the process. Mr. Tinney? Sorry, I'm just looking to the, the applicant. Two years is, is what was requested by the applicant, uh, and so that was what uh, staff put, in, put forward in, in front of uh, a council. If council wanted to look at a different uh, time frame, certainly we could bring some information back on, on other time frames that might be more appropriate, uh, but that was what was, was requested. Okay, so that, so that um, I, well, I guess... <laughs> In putting it forward and recommending it, uh, I assume that the department had some view that two years was a reasonable length of time, whereas I assume if it had been re five years had been requested, your, your recommendation might have been different. That is correct. Two years seems reasonable in terms of uh, a movable structure that isn't making uh, permanent changes to, to the heritage elements. Um, in order to allow for the applicant to, to uh, undertake some, some more permanent solutions. Um, again, uh, that was what was requested. It seemed reasonable to staff, and so uh, that recommendation was made. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, please. It's to receive the report on the uh, impacts, financial impacts of management of outdoor sheltering. 
I don't think anyone wants to move this. <laughs> I'll move this. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Loveday. Uh, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next. Next is uh, authorizing the mayor to, uh, on behalf of council, provide a letter uh, in feedback to the Minister of Community, Sport and Cultural Development that council supports the regulation of rideshare services in a manner consistent with taxis in BC and request the province to modernize the regulatory framework of the taxi industry. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Discussion? Okay, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next. Next is a two-part uh, motion on short-term okay, vacation so rentals. Thank you. You know what you were going to do, Councillor Lucas, and then I'll go next. Thank you. As a general manager of a hotel, I would be in conflict of interest, so I must excuse myself. And as someone who uh, is close to someone who runs an Airbnb, I would have a bias, so I will excuse myself as well. Okay. As... Uh Acting Mayor for next month and Acting Mayor today in the absence of this month's Acting Mayor, uh, I will uh, ask if any uh, councillors would like to move the recommendation from the committee. Mo moved by Councillor Thornton, Joe, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Uh, discussion? Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carries unanimously. The Mayor helps and Councillor Lucas can return to the chamber. Sorry, uh, they were divided. <laughs> Sorry, folks. We... You had them both? Okay, our city clerk advises that both have been approved. Yeah, the absent council members may return to the chamber. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, I, there's no seconder, I don't think. Really? What happens if nothing? Nobody seconds. It goes to the park's master plan, as discussed earlier. Well, I mean, it's been properly moved and seconded. We can. I'm not going to be obstructionist. Do we need to debate it again? Okay, all those in favor? One, two, all those opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, uh, that fails. And this work will be done, it just won't be done as expediently, potentially, as we would have liked, or as members of the public would have liked. Um, okay, Mr. Coates uh, has indicated that there uh, is one bylaw that needs an amendment. Um, Ms. Havelka, the Deputy City Clerk, is um, circulating that. Uh, it's a change to the sidewalk cafe bylaw. So, Mr. Coates, we're in your hands uh, for the bylaws this evening. Thank you. So, for first reading, there's a block of four. Uh, first is zoning uh, amendment bylaw number 16-051. Uh, uh, second is uh, zoning amendment bylaw number 16-053. Third is uh, fish community plan amendment bylaw 16-054. And fourth is the housing agreement for 605-629 speed, 606-618 Francis Avenue, and that's bylaw number 16-055 for first reading. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto. Is there a seconder? Any seconder for the bylaws for first reading? Thank you, Councillor Young. Discussion? Uh, okay, all those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coates? And it's that same block of four for second reading. Thank you, moved by Councillor Alto. Seconded by Councillor Lucas, thank you. All those in favor, any opposed, thanks. For third reading, uh, firstly, it's the uh, housing agreement bylaw for Speed and Francis Avenue. Thank you, moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. All those in favor, any opposed, thank you. Mayor Helps, members of council, so it's um, this next block here is it's bylaw 16-038 and that's the sidewalk cafes regulation bylaw. So just to bring to council's attention that staff had uh, indicated uh, 
earlier in the day that there there was um, an error in the in the bylaw that council has already given three readings to, and uh, so Ms. Avelka has passed out a, an amended version of that bylaw. But just for clarity, what that uh, what the the corrections need to uh, consist of in the amended version are the removal of um, part ten of the uh, original bylaw on page two, which makes reference to the commencement date for the bylaw, and the second change is the elimination of what was section 20, which was the actual commencement date. The bylaw had a provision in it that said it was going to commence on May the 16th, but that date is of course passed. And so uh, the removal of that would default to the commencement of the bylaw upon adoption. So in order to affect those changes, which are technically required for the bylaw to be um, able to be um, authorizing the regulations that it purports to do, um, the first part of this would require council passing a motion to rescind through reading that was given to the bylaw previously. Okay, so could we have someone move the, okay, Councillor Young has moved rescinding third reading. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Loveday. Discussion? Okay, all those in favor of rescinding third reading. Any opposed? Okay, thank you, Mr. Coates. So the next step then would be that council uh, pass the, the following motion, and that would be to amend the sidewalk cafe bylaw by uh, removing part 10 commencement on page two and page 12 of the bylaw. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Young. Second by Councillor Lucas. Uh, discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. And lastly, to give uh, the amended bylaw number 16-038, third reading. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto. Seconded by Councillor Lucas. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. And then I just point out too that on on council's agenda is is an accompanying ticket authorization bylaw for this uh, sidewalk cafes regulation that procedurally is perhaps most appropriate to uh, to be withheld adoption tonight and to come back with the sidewalk cafe regulation bylaw for final consideration and adoption at the next regular council meeting. Okay. Any objections to that? Okay. Thank you very much uh, for. Uh, you're uh, catching that and fixing it now before we'd adopted the bylaw. Um, so that brings us next then to correspondence. Um, we have three items of correspondence uh, for our information. Um, Mr. Coates, I guess we'll take them one at a time. I have a question about number three. The first is uh, correspondence from the City of Port Alberni um, requesting the City's support for declaration of their right to a healthy environment. And that council received that letter for information. Thank you. Can we have moved for information? So, Thanks. Moved by Councillor Thornton Joe. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Alto. Discussion? Okay, yes, Councillor Isaac. Yeah, it was uh, great to see this support from uh, Port Alberni. Um, unfortunately, the city's motion didn't hit the convention floor at FCM, and so we will be following up. And there's a bit of a weird procedure around um, resolutions at FCM where it appears the FCM board has assumed the policy making role that in a lot of other contexts um, delegates are empowered to set policy. So I think once Councillor Coleman is back uh, as our uh, representative on the board we should look into whether some amendments uh, may be advisable to FCM's constitution uh, to empower local governments and transfer some of that policy making authority from the board uh, to the delegated convention. Um, and so that's one matter. There was also some ruling that our motion this year calling for a federal bill of environmental rights was too close to our motion from last year calling for municipal declaration. So it seems to me that there's both bureaucratic and political roadblocks at FCM towards uh, taking this sensible policy. But fortunately, our colleagues closer to home in Port Alberni uh, do uh, recognize the wisdom uh, of advocating in this way to the federal government. Thank you. Any further speakers? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, please. Next is the uh, letter of appreciation from uh, the District of Saanich for uh, the city's fire department response to a uh, fire on Cedar Hill Road okay, and to you. receive for information. Thanks. Moved for information by Councillor Thornton Joe. Is there a seconder? Seconded by uh, Councillor Alto. Discussion? Okay, yes, thank you for helping out our neighbors. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next. Next uh, for information is the uh, correspondence from the Minister of Community, Sport and Cultural Development updating on the progress of the Capital Integrated Services and Governance Initiative. 
Okay, can we have that moved for information? Thanks. Receipt has been moved by Councillor uh, Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Um, I have a question for our city manager. It says in here, third paragraph, um, that one of the consultants will be reaching out to our CAO in order to set up a meeting before the end of June. Uh, has that happened? Not at this time. Okay, will you contact um, uh, them, Dale at Circle Square Solutions? They. I know Mr. Wall from his days at the ministry, and I'll be happy to Excellent. Discuss. Okay, because I, we would, I think, be very interested in giving our input on this matter. It's a very important one, um, and the time is ticking in June. So if we could get that meeting set up, that would be great. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, all those Actually, oh, Mayor yes? Helps, I was referring to a meeting with myself, but we do have a meeting scheduled uh, for them to come to council. And Mr. Coates, can you let us know when that is? It's June 23rd. Excellent. The committee the whole meeting. Very good. Okay. Well done. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Okay. And the next item of business uh, is a, oh, the hearings. Merrill Simmons Council also setting public hearings um, for June 23rd, and that first one is a rezoning application for 515 Burnside Road East, and the second is a rezoning application for Speed and Francis Avenue. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Lucas. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. And now we have a motion uh, from Councillor's uh, new business. So, Councillors? If you could put your motion on the table. I'd like to uh, move um, that council, sorry, just jumping ahead here. It's there on the screen for you. That council directs staff to provide input to the Government of Canada on behalf of the City of Victoria by June 23rd, 2016, as part of the Review of Canada Post, reiterating the City's support for door-to-door -door postal delivery and increased access to financial services through postal banking and appending copies of the previously approved resolutions on these issues. Okay, mm -hmm. moved by Councillor Isaac, seconded by Councillor Loveday. Discussion? Um, yeah, yes. this, this isn't creating any new policy. It's um, proposing that we uh, send the previous two policies we've adopted to inform this review that's now underway. And the deadline for receipt of submissions is June 23rd, 2016. So if approved tonight, uh, hopefully this can be sent off in an expeditious way. And just from a formatting standpoint, if there's any way for staff to take the motions into something a bit more coherent than just the minutes, I don't know if we ever do that, but if the, the approved motion could be on a one-pager, it might be more presentable to the federal task force that's reviewing this, but we'll leave that in staff's hands. We certainly will leave it to staff to make it presentable and all that stuff. Yes, Councillor Alto. Uh, I just wanted to uh, indicate uh, quite a contented support for this, uh, given the work that we did last year. This is very consistent with the uh, previous resolutions that we adopted, and I think it should be a relatively straightforward task to uh, provide these uh, in a form of input for this particular process. And I'd actually just like to, on the record, thank the federal government for having this process so that there is an opportunity at least for a conversation about these issues. Okay, seeing no further speakers, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. And I believe the next uh, motion on the sheet, conveniently there for us, in case we would forget, is a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Loveday. Is there a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Alto. Council, thank you. Very good work today, both uh, earlier today and this evening. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you.